prologue of lightning by winchell smith and frank bacon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Lightning Bill Jones, read by Todd. John Marvin, read by Andrew Gotts. Raymond Thomas, read by Andrew James. Lemuel Townsend, read by Alan Mapstone. Rodney Harper, read by Stephen Fellows. Everett Hammond, read by Wayne Cook. Nevin Blodgett, Sheriff, read by Son of the Exiles. Oscar Nelson, read by Greg Giordano. Fred Peters, read by Paul Harvey. Walter Lennon, read by Jim Locke. Zeb Crothers, read by Larry Wilson. Liveryman, read by jim locke clerk read by larry wilson teddy read by wayne cook mildred buckley read by annie mars mrs jones read by sonia mrs margaret davis read by devora allen mrs harper read by diane castillo frida read by laura emma emily jarvis read by sandra schmidt mrs moore read by jen broda mrs jordan read by t j burns mrs starr read by wendy katz hiller mrs coxhall read by avayi mrs preston read by michelle eaton stage directions read by Anne b sweet thirteen Stage Directions, read by Scotty Smith Lightning, Prologue John Marvin's Cabin in Nevada, near Lake Tahoe Rough log cabin of one room Small window up left center Door up right center On the left wall is a shelf Built out and held up by two rough sticks Wooden water pail tin wash basin. Over shelf is a box nailed to wall with comb, brush, soap, toothbrush, shaving cup, razor strop, etc. Above box is a small cheap mirror, an old kerosene oil stove in front of a rough fireplace with tea kettle on stove. Above fireplace, on wall, are frying pans and a few other cooking utensils. On a little shelf, a few cheap plates, cups, knives, spoons. Up left center, an old bunk with blanket and old quilt. Sheets and pillows. Left of bunk, a small trunk, locked. Old piece of carpet just below bunk. Hanging on wall, a pair of old rubber boots. On floor, laces shoes, and old slippers. Hanging above trunk, which is right of door, a suit of clothes, which John wears in Act One, carefully stretched on hanger, also hat. Down right, a rough table with ten or a dozen law books on it. Chair, front left of it, also writing materials, a tin alarm clock. Kyrsone lamp hangs above table right, all cheap. A cabinet picture in a plain black leather frame, not new. Beside this, a small china mug with a few wild flowers drooping. Between this table and door, a rifle, a shotgun, and two axes in rack. Down left center, a rough table. On the table, some unwashed dishes, tin coffee cup, sugar bowl, and open can of condensed milk. Two chairs supposed to have been made by John, solid but very rough. One is back of table and facing it, one is left. 
at rise, stage is empty. There is a rapid knock on the door right center. Oscar, enter behind window, looking back left. Mr. Marvin, Mr. Marvin. Opens door hurriedly, peers in, sees cabin empty, comes in quickly, closing door, goes off to window left of door, looks out. As door shuts, there is a pause. Sheriff crosses window, knocks on door. Come in. Enter Sheriff, goes down center. Oscar drops down stage front of table. What do you want? You're John Marvin, ain't you? No, sir. Well, then, you're working for him, ain't you? Who I work for than my business. None of that. You're with the gang that's been chopping down that timber. Oscar turns left. You know Marvin is stealing it, don't you? Oscar turns to Sheriff. Stealing? Yes, from the Pacific Railroad Company. Now I'm sheriff of this county. And I got a warrant for Marvin's rest. Huh? Goes left and up to window. You know where he is, don't you? I know he gone away. Where? I not know. Sheriff moves to Oscar. Where did he go? Oscar goes to left to shelf. He go yesterday. When's he coming back? Oscar, at window left, looking at stove. I not think he's coming back at all. It's going to be mighty bad for you if you're lying to me. Oscar goes to him menacingly. If you call me liar. Crosses up to door right of center. Opens it. Comes down right of Sheriff. I throw you out that door. Sheriff crosses to Oscar. If you threaten me, the next thing you'll find yourself in is jail. Starts upright. Don't forget that. Exit upright center to left. Oscar goes to window and looks off left. Door opens quietly. John enters. Oscar turns quickly and sees him. John holds finger to his lips. Oscar turns again and looks out of window. John goes close to him. John, to table right, puts flowers in glass, takes old ones and puts them in box under table, and acts against front of table. Do you see him? He got on his horse and start down the trail. There he goes, look. Good. You got rid of him very well, Oscar. Much obliged to you. Collects dirty dishes from table, crosses, and puts them in pan. He tell me. I know what he told you. I was out there listening to him. Then do that land belong to railroad? John, light stove, gets water from bucket left, puts it in coffee pot, Puts pot on stove. It does now, Oscar. But I sold the timber a long time before the railroad got the property, and I'm trying to save it for the man who bought it. And can they arrest you for that? Not unless they can find me. And me and my boys. Can they arrest us too? No, they won't touch the boys. You fellows are working for me. Oscar goes over front of table center to table. Oh, you know that from your law books? John puts coffee in pot. Yes, Oscar. Anyhow, you'll be gone in the morning. That job's done, thank heaven. Did you have the boys sign the payroll? Oscar, handing over paper. Yes, sir. John, taking paper. Thank you, Oscar. Oh, and Oscar... If that sheriff or anybody else asks the boys when the timber was cut, tell them not to remember, will you? Oh, 
Ye don't want anybody find out when we do it. That's the idea, Oscar. Nobody find out from us, ye bet ye life. Exits right center. Harper's voice, outside. Say, who's the boss of this gang here? Boss gone away. John, on hearing the voice, goes to door, swings it open, and calls off right. Hello, Mr. Harper. Come in. After a pause, Harper enters and stands in doorway. I didn't expect to find you here. Harper is a keen, honest, rough American of forty, clothes plain and ill-fitting, flannel shirt and collar, slouch hat. Although dressed roughly, his clothes must not look cheap. His appearance, despite a good deal of dust, is cleanly. I'm mighty glad to see you. Sit down, won't you? Offers chair left of table. Harper, grimly eyeing John. Wait a minute, till I get our relations straightened out a bit. Closes door, comes down right center. I had a notion that when I met up with you, I'd put a bullet into you. Well, can't you shoot sitting down? You don't think I mean it, eh? I don't think you figured on what I'd be doing. We'll see what you'd be doing when I find out how the land lays. Just before my trip east, I bought a grove of timber from you and paid you cash for it. And when I get back yesterday, I learn you've sold the property, timber and all, to the railroad. I didn't know your timber was still on the property. When you bought it, you were going to cut it down right away. Harper turns away from John, thinking, then turns back to him quickly. But you told me you were never going to part with a foot of the property because your mother was so crazy over it. That's right. It was her dream that we'd have a home here sometime. Do you remember why I sold you that timber? I remember what you said. Your mother was sick and you needed the money. Yes, I brought her to San Francisco where she had the best care and the best doctors in the town. Is she there now? John, shaking his head. No, she's dead. Oh. Crosses the table right. Picks up picture of John's mother. I'm sorry to hear that. Harper looks at the picture and sits as John speaks. When we got to San Francisco, a lawyer named Raymond Thomas came to see my mother at the hospital, and he said he wanted to buy a piece of this property and build a home here after he'd retired from practice. He found out that I was studying law, and he offered to take me into his office and help me in every way he could. I was mighty glad of the chance and spent all my time at his office when I wasn't with Mother. One day she told me she thought we ought to sell Mr. Thomas the land he wanted because he had taken such an interest in me. Mother got worse right after that, and I didn't think any more about it. When she... after the funeral was over, I found that she had sold Thomas the property he wanted and had taken payment in some stock in a land company that I don't believe is worth the paper it's written on. Harper rises. As soon as this lawyer got the property, he sold it to the railroad for a big price? Yes. Well, when you found that out, why the devil didn't you kill him? John smiles. It was just about that time I found you hadn't cut down your timber, and you were way off in the east. Well, you couldn't do anything about that, could you? Only one thing I could think of. What was that? Cut it down and get it over on my property. What? Goes to door, upright center. Opens it. Looks off right. You got all my timber over on your property? Yes, we finished the job today. Oh, I had it all wrong. I thought that gang out there were working for the railroad. No, they've been working for me. The next thing is to get the timber away. Oh, I'll take care of that. Closes door. It may not be as easy as you think. We've just had a visit from a sheriff. What did he want? He wanted me. The railroad company sent him after me. Of course, if they can prove when the timber was taken down, they can recover. In that case, if you'll give me time, I'm going to return every cent you paid for it. You'll do nothing of the sort. I'll take all the chances from now on. I guess I was a little sharp when I first came in. Ah, oh, that's all right. But everything's gone wrong with me today. First there was a strike at the sawmill. Then I heard about this thing, and just as I was starting out here to look into it, I had a row with my wife. Sits left of table center. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Crosses and sits on front of table center. I didn't mind the strike and this timber mix-up so much, but the other thing, well, that ain't my line. And there's no reason for it. Rises, crosses to right, then back to John at center. That's what makes me sore. I bought her a present when I was east and had it shipped home by express. It arrived at the office this morning. I was showing it to Miss Robbins. She's my stenographer. When my wife walks in, saw it and thought I bought it for Miss Robbins. But surely you could explain that. Do you think so? Yes. That's because you've never been married. The more I tried to explain, the worse it looked. Nah. Aw, hell, what's the use talking about it? Let's get back to business. I figured it'd cost $800 to do that job out there. Reaching in pocket. And that's just what I'm going to hand you for it. I couldn't take it, Mr. Harper. Why not? Because you haven't got that timber yet. Well, the railroad have some job on their hands to get it away from me. And unless they do, I owe you $800, you understand? John facing front, as though he hears something at door. As John tiptoes to door, Harper goes guardedly to left center, puts hand to back pocket, reaching for gun. John jerks open the door, and Bill Jones wanders past him towards center. Bill is a little old man, rather shabbily dressed. He has a slight and a very quiet jag. He carries a few honeysuckle shoots. Wrapped in a newspaper. Bill comes down right center. Strip lights in foots. Start down. Blue spotlight at left. Starts on amber. Goes down in window left. Why, hello, Lightning. You were so still out there, I thought it was somebody spying on us. I was a spy once. With Buffalo Bill. Bill stares at Harper as he speaks. This is Lightning Bill Jones, Mr. Harper. How'd you do? Takes chair from left of table center and places it in front of it. Takes out notebook and pencil and starts to write. How are you? What were you so quiet about, Bill? I knocked on the door. He goes up and deposits hat and packages on bunk up center. Well, it wasn't a very loud one. I didn't want to disturb you. I always make em knock easy like that at the hotel. Comes down right of table. Mr. Jones is a hotel proprietor. Harper looks up at Bill. That's so. Got the best hotel on the lake. Sit down, Bill. No, can't stop. Gotta be home at supper time to see everything's going right. What time do you have supper at your hotel? Supper's at... uh, what time is it now? John looks at clock on shelf right. Nearly seven o'clock. Bill, after a moment's thought. They can get along without me. I got everything systematized. John, looking at him sharply. I'm afraid you've been drinking, Bill. John lights lamp that is hanging above table right. No, just been saying goodbye to the boys out there. They are breaking camp. And they wanted to have you take a few farewell drinks. I didn't like to hurt their feelings. To Harper. Railroad man. John, smiling. Oh, no. Mr. Harper's the man I sold that timber to. Harper, looking up to John. Does he know about it? Bill knows the property belongs to the railroad, and he's been a little worried. Bill, looking at Harper. That's the best timber in Washoe County. Yes, I know it is. Except a piece I got. John prepares supper. Bill sits on table center. Harper, looking at him amused. Is your place in Nevada? Some of it is. More of it's in California. The state line runs right through my hotel. John fixes coffee. You've heard of Lightning's Hotel, haven't you, Mr. Harper? Harper, turning to John. I'm afraid not. I guess you're the only one. John, putting beans on fire. He just got back from the east, Bill. 
He would have heard of it if he'd been at home. Why, what about it? John, wash his hands. Well, you see, Bill's house was on the state line, and his wife got the idea of turning it into a summer hotel. I give her the idea. So they enlarged the house, called it the Calivada Hotel, and got ready for a rush of guests. And nobody came. But just when it looked like a failure and they were about ready to close up, the miracle happened. Drying hands. It wasn't no miracle. I knew it would happen all the time. Harper to Bill. What was it? Women began to arrive, and they all wanted rooms on the Nevada side, and they wanted them for six months. Harper laughs. Ha! <laughs> the Reno Divorce Brigade. Yes. Of course, everybody knows what a woman goes to Reno for, but at Bill's Hotel she can get a room on the Nevada side and make her friends think she's at a California resort. Takes two plates, knives, forks, and spoons, and puts them on table center. So instead of failing, the Calivada is a big success. Of course, this is Bill's story. No, it ain't. I can tell it better than that. John goes back to stove left. John's never seen the hotel. I haven't had time. And we haven't known each other long. I never saw John till I happened by here about a month ago. Oh, been in this part of the country long? Bill, on corner of table. Came out during the gold excitement. The gold excitement was back in 49. Well, they were still excited when I got here. Ha! <laughs> And you didn't happen to be one of the lucky ones. Lucky? I located more claims than any man ever that came out here. I'm a civil engineer. Oh, you ought to be a mighty rich man. Uh, always cheated out of my share. How's that? Crooked partners. Well, couldn't you do anything to them? I shot some, put all the others in the penitentiary, except one. What happened to him? He died before I got him. <laughs> died of fright, perhaps. I guess so. Harper picks up hat, puts chair left of table left center, rises, laughs. Well, I'll get out before you tell me any more. I've got all I can remember at one time, and I shouldn't like to forget any of it. Goes up to door right of center. John, coming to table center with coffee cups. I'm trying to fix some supper for you. Harper, with a slight glance at the food. No, thanks. I'll be in trucking in two hours. Bill, looking out window right. That's your automobile out there, ain't it? Yes. And it'll get you to trucky in two hours? John brings food to table. Harper, coming back, meets him in front of table. Harper to Bill. That's what it will. To John, coming down to front of table center. Well, Marvin, I'm going to send the trucks down here tomorrow and start hauling. Had I better be around? No, I don't think so. You take a vacation. Then if there's a kick, no one here will know anything about it. I'll keep you posted, or I'd just as soon give you that 800 right now. Pulls out money. Bill, coming down right, looks at it. No, thank you, sir. And I shan't forget the way you've treated me. Harper. Patting John on his shoulder. How'd you expect me to treat you after that job out there? Shakes hands. Goodbye, Marvin. Goodbye, Mr. Jones. Starts up to door. Oh, if you want to get rid of some of that money, perhaps you'd cash a check for me. Harper, shrewdly, comes down left of Bill. Let's see it. Bill, taking check from pocket, hands it to Harper. Oh, it's good, I guess. Harper, looking at it. Oh, pension. So you're in the war, too. First man to enlist. Harper, handing it back. Endorse it. What's that? Write your name on the back of it. Ah, I always do that. Showing Harper check. See all those names on there? Secretary of the Treasury and all of them? Harper nods. It ain't no good unless I sign it. Goes to table right. Sits. Endorses check. Harper counts out money. Laughing as he does so. 
Harper, hand some money, takes check. Here you are, Mr. Jones. Good night, Marvin. Good night, Harper. Harper exits and to write. John brings beans, bread, and coffee to table. He's a fine man, Bill. Bill, rising. He's a fast driver. John, offering Bill chair back of table. Sit down and have some supper. No, just had a snack outside with the boys. John sits and begins to eat beans and bread. Oh. But I don't want to be unfriendly. I'd just as soon take a drink with you. I haven't got anything, Bill. Yes, you have. Produces bottle. You mean you have. No, Oscar made you a present of it, and he asked me to bring it in to you. Hands bottle to John. Oh. Takes it. Bill holds coffee cup expectantly. John puts bottle down on left side of table. I don't think you ought to drink any more tonight, Bill. Try some coffee. No, go on and eat. Don't mind me. Puts cup down. John pours coffee. Here the railroad had a sheriff after you. How did you know? Oscar told me. You remember what I promised you? What was that, Bill? If they go to court, I'll come and be a witness. Raising voice. Positive for first time. I can swear those trees was cut before you sold the property. John stops eating and looks at him. John, smiling and going on with supper. I couldn't let you swear to that, Bill. You can't help yourself. I got a right to swear to what I like. But I haven't got to prove when those trees were cut. They have. I know it. Oh, do you? Yes, used to be a lawyer. Well, why don't you practice? I didn't need any practice. And I promise you, if they go to court, I'll be there. And I never broke a promise yet. Crosses to right, taking out cigarette papers, make cigarette. Lightman, does anybody home know where you are? Not unless they're mind readers. How far is it to your hotel? Seven miles. Is it all right for you to be here, Bill? Bill, turning to John, starting out. Do you want me to go? Of course not. You know better than that. But, I mean, won't they worry about you? Who, the boarders? No, your wife. Oh, mother. She's got plenty to do. Sometimes I wonder if she approves of your going off as you do, and your drinking. She certainly doesn't like to have you drink, does she, Bill? I don't drink. Well, if you did drink, she wouldn't like it, would she? You know how some women are. They're curious about some things. Then all these tall yarns you tell. Now what does your wife think about them? I don't tell her none. John gives it up, smiles and goes on eating. Bill smiles at him affectionately. He goes to table right, picks up picture, and turns with it in his hand. John looks up and their eyes meet. I was over there this afternoon. Where are you, Bill? John stops eating. Bill returns the picture to table. You got things growing there, ain't you? Looks fine. When did you get time to do it? John goes and puts out stove. Sunday. Bill gets package from bunk up center. I brought these honeysuckle shoots to plant there, but I guess you got plenty without them now. John crosses to left of Bill right center. No, I want them. Takes package and crosses to table right. Thank you for remembering, Bill. Thank you very much. I know just the place for them. I'll set them out in the morning. Puts package in front of table right. Sits, picks up picture. They are off the finest vine in California. I suppose it's a little lonesome for you now without her, ain't it? Well, it's all different, Bill. But I have too much to do to be lonesome. Turns. Starts to work on law books. If you have trouble, Bill, keep busy. That's the best thing. 
Oh, I could stay here tonight, if you thought I'd be any company for you. John, laying his hand on Bill's arm. You'd be great company for anybody, Bill, but I don't believe you'd better. They'll worry about you at home. Goes back to work on law books. And you've got studying to do, ain't you? Yes. Bill, turning at Bunk as he picks up Hat. Well, good night. Good night, Bill. Bill sees Bottle, looks at him, then goes and takes Bottle from left of table center and puts it in pocket, goes up to door, opens it. John rises. Bill. Bill turns and faces him. You won't drink any more tonight, will you? Bill looks at him a moment sheepishly, then slowly closes door, takes Bottle out of pocket, and offers it to John. No, you can keep it, Bill. Bill puts Bottle quickly into pocket. Only I want you to go home sober. I don't drink nothing. And you won't take a drink out of that bottle tonight? No. Starts out. Are you going straight home? Bill, avoiding his eye. Uh-huh. You're not going to stop anywhere on the way? No. You just told me you never broke a promise, Bill. That's right. Will you promise me to take home all that pension money, every cent of it? Bill thinks it over first. Yes. Good night, Lightman. Bill goes to door at once. John goes to table and settles down to study. Bill tries to tear himself away, but wanders back toward John again. I'd just as soon leave the bottle here now, if you want me to. Pause. John is buried in his work. I won't touch it tonight, now that I've promised you. Pause. Waits for John to answer. He doesn't. That'll be all right, won't it? Bill gives it up. Once more, however, he comes down and watches him. Then muses. Studying. Starts up to door. That's how I got my start. He is going out as curtain falls slowly. Curtain. End of prologue. Act One, Scene One of Lightning by Winchell Smith and Frank Bacon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act One, Scene One. Scene, a small hotel on the border between California and Nevada. There is a door right to dining room, a door down right to parlor, and a door in back flat center to the road upright. In alcove, there is a door to the kitchen, and a door up left, in alcove not used. There are two staircases, one left and right to the rooms. At the top of each, an arch with curtains. In the circle of the stairways, there are two counters, with a register on each. A large fish hangs over the center of arch at back. There are two rugs running up and down stage center, with about six inches between, marking the state line. The ground cloth is brown, striped to represent boards. On the railing of stairway right and left, there is a letter box with keys or tags. Down in front of stairway right, an old-fashioned hall rack and umbrella stand. At left, front of stairway, an old whatnot filled with old pieces of bric-a-brac, an unupholstered chair just right of this. Down center, a small old-fashioned round table with chairs right and left of it. Camera on table, off in doorway right, a small stand with toothpicks in a glass vase on it. It is placed to hold door open. A small rug in front, and off stage of doors right and left outside of door center a fence running from right to left in the center of which 
there is a sign reading California slash Nevada. California right, Nevada left. A drop with mountains and a lake and a waterfall on it. A ground row in front of this with part of a lake on it. Bare brackets right and left of door center and above doors right and left. A chandelier hangs in center. As the curtain rises, Mrs. Jordan is seated in chair right of table center. Mrs. Starr enters from down right. Waitress comes down Nevada stairs with tray of dishes, crosses and exits down right. Mrs. Cockshell enters from door left. All women are dressed for a walk. Mrs. Jordan to Mrs. Starr. Have you had enough? Goodness, yes. Mrs. Moore comes down Nevada stairs. Mrs. Moore to Mrs. Starr. Hello? Mrs. Starr to Mrs. Cogshell. Sorry if I kept you waiting. That's all right, dear. Mrs. Starr meets Mrs. Cogshell at center. They exit up center and to right. Mrs. Moore to Mrs. Jordan. Are you ready? Yes. But don't you think we ought to ask Mrs. Preston to come with us? Oh, Lord. Sits. I know what you mean, but I feel so awfully sorry for her. Well, I have no sympathy for a woman who can't hold her husband. But I have. And I've heard that Mr. Preston is only waiting to get this divorce until he can... Enter Mrs. Preston from dining room. Takes parcel from hall rack. Starts upright. Mrs. Moore, seeing Mrs. Preston. Shh! Mrs. Jordan rises. Oh, Mrs. Preston. Mrs. Preston comes down. We're going over to the waterfall to take some snapshots. And we thought you might like to come along, too. Mrs. Moore. Rises, comes down center. Yes, do come, Mrs. Preston. Why, thank you, I'd love to. Crosses left above table to look at mailbox. But do you know if the mail has come yet? I know it hasn't, and it's disgraceful. I suppose Mr. Jones has gone for it again. No wonder they call him lightning. Monday he didn't get back until supper time, and when he did come back, he could hardly walk. I'm going to speak to Mrs. Jones about it. Oh, please don't. There probably wasn't anything for me anyway. And you can't find Mrs. Jones now. She's always in the kitchen at mealtime. Then I'll speak to her daughter, if I can pry her away from that young man for a moment. To Mrs. Preston. He's still in the dining room, isn't he? But he's not Millie's young man. She was employed in his office in San Francisco. Well, there's no reason because she worked for him that he can't be in love with her. Such a man would hardly be in love with a head waitress. Picking up camera. Whether he's in love with her or not, I'm going to ask her about the mail. Millie, may I speak to you for a moment? Slight pause. Millie enters from dining room. Yes, Mrs. Moore? Do you know why the mail hasn't arrived? Perhaps the train is late today. It couldn't be this late. It's nearly two o'clock and the train's due at ten. Well, who went for the mail? Your father? Yes, I believe he did. Why in the world would they let him go for it? Gets bags. You see, dear... The mail is the most exciting event of the day. I'm very sorry. Well, I suggest another mail carrier. Gets bag from table center. Women gather up their things and start up stage at center. Thomas enters from dining room. Takes hat from rack. Crosses up stage. Do you have all you wanted? No, but I had all I could hold. He joins women who turn back when he enters. The food here is ripping, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Yes, Mrs. Perfectly Jones, it's a wonderful table. Everyone it's says splendid. that. 
Going for a stroll? Yes, yes we, were. we were. Won't you come with us? Yes, oh, do. come along. I'm sorry, I can't possibly. I've got my packing to do. I'm leaving on the afternoon boat. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm awfully sorry you're going so soon. Why, you only came three days ago. Women exit center saying, Goodbye. So pleased to have met you. I hope you'll be back before long. Thomas to Millie. It's a shame to miss a stroll with them. Coming back to Millie right front of counter. What's the matter, Millie? Daddy. Anything happened to him? He went for the mail at nine o'clock this morning and hasn't got back yet. Oh, well, don't let that worry you. After I get my things packed, I'll go out and see if I can hunt him up. Millie, coming over to him right center. As if you hadn't done enough for us already. But now I think of it, I've got to see lightning before I go. Must you? Why, the place belongs to Mother. But Bill happens to be her husband, so we need his name, too. Oh, dear. What if we can't find him before you go? Thomas crosses the back of counter, gets keys. Well, in that case, I can leave the papers here, and you can get his signature and send them on to me. So, that's all right. Crosses to Millie, left center. You do know how much I appreciate all you've done for us, don't you? Why, it's nothing at all, Millie. Nothing at all? When I didn't know which way to turn, and Mother was about frantic, and then you came here and in no time arranged everything so that Mother and Daddy are going to be better off than they ever dreamed of? But it was the simplest thing in the world. I just happened to think what to do. That was all. Mrs. Jones enters from kitchen, starts for stairs left. Thomas sees her. Oh, hello, Mrs. Jones. Oh, excuse me. Starts back for kitchen. Millie going to her and catching her. Oh, mother, no, you're not going back into that hot kitchen. Brings her down center to chair right of table center. You've been working out there three mortal hours. Mrs. Jones looking at Thomas. But I don't look presentable. Come now, you mustn't mind me, Mrs. Jones. Do sit down, mother. You look ready to drop. Mrs. Jones sits right of table. Mrs. Jones to Thomas, rolling down sleeves. She's always telling me that. Sometime I think I'll fall down just to satisfy her. Millie's right. You do work a great deal too hard. The work has to be done. Fixing hair. Well, it won't be long before you can say goodbye to hard work for the rest of your life. I can scarcely realize that yet. Rises. But I do realize that I owe it all to you. I only wish I could tell you how grateful I am. Thomas starts upstairs. Well, I'm going to get out for fear you'll try. Hang on to her, Millie, and make her take a rest. Thomas exits up California stairs. Mrs. Jones crosses towards California desk right center. There. Now I've driven him away. Turns to Millie. Why, no you haven't. He's going up to pack. Takes table up left of door center. Is he really leaving this afternoon? Yes. I don't see why he wants to hurry away. Why, he's arranged everything about selling the place. There's nothing more to stay for. Takes chair from right of center. Places it in front of California desk. You're here, ain't you? Oh, mother. Coming down right of Mrs. Jones. Please get that foolish idea out of your head. Foolish idea? <laughs> Sits left center. Why, Millie, every letter you wrote home all the time you was working in his office showed that he cared for you. Why, I never wrote you anything of the sort. Never. I could read between the lines. And if he isn't in love with you, why is he planning for us to come and live in San Francisco? 
I'm planning that. Crosses to Mrs. Jones and places his arm around her and leans cheek on Mrs. Jones's head. For years you've worked like a slave, and now you deserve to see something of life and have some good times. The very idea of the city frightens me. Why, you've talked of going to the city ever since I can remember. Mrs. Jones, looking at Millie. I know I have, but now that I can go, I'm afraid I'm going to look out of place, that I won't know how to dress right and... I'm going to see that you have just as nice things as any other women who is stopping here. They look at each other and smile. Mrs. Jones to front. Then this Bill. Rises. I'm so afraid of the way he'll behave. Crosses left a little, turns to Millie. When his pension comes, you must take him to town and buy him some new clothes. Millie, with sudden thought. Is it time for his pension to come here? Why? Turns and looks at letterbox left, then turns back to Millie. Ain't he back with the mail yet? Not yet. Oh. Oh, mother, then you think his pension has come? Mrs. Jones turns to Millie. I think it's come and gone. Crosses to back of Nevada desk, looks under desk, turns and looks at mailbox, then back at the desk. After Mrs. Jones's back of desk left, Millie crosses to desk right, watching Mrs. Jones. I found him hanging around this desk this morning, and it took him forever to get started. I wonder... Opens register and finds flask, holds it up. There. He was waiting for a chance to get at this. Millie crosses to Mrs. Jones. Anyway goes and puts her arm around her don't let's blame him for anything until we're sure now please go up and have a good rest crosses right to dining room door mrs jones crosses the kitchen door i've got to go to the kitchen first what for why if he should come home sober you want to keep something hot for him he don't deserve a mouthful. Millie, imitating Mrs. Jones. No, of course not. Mrs. Jones exits into kitchen. I'll set a place for him. Exits right. Bill enters slowly from porch, papers and letters under his arm. He looks about, then beckons to Zeb off right. Whistling, darling, I am growing old. Starts left, looks up center. Zeb Crothers appears cautiously in doorway. He is a very old man, shabbily dressed. Bill turning and seeing Zeb. Come on, Zeb. What are you afraid of? Where's your old woman? That's all right. She ain't here. I don't believe ye got a drop. Takes one step in door. Bill goes to desk left and raises lid of register. I'll show you. Mrs. Jones enters briskly from kitchen. Zeb, seeing her, hurries out center. Bill closes desk quickly, goes to letter rack, and begins sorting mail. Mrs. Jones rushes to door center to Zeb, who has run out door center. Clear out now. Comes back and turns. Sees Bill. Walks deliberately down center, above the chair left center. Bill Jones, where have you been? Bill looks around as though surprised to see her there. Holds position a moment, then speaks pleasantly, as if she hadn't spoken to him, still whistling. Hello, mother. Goes on sorting mail. She watches him angrily and advances a step. Do you know what time it is? Bill pays no attention. It's after two o'clock. She stands, glaring at him. He goes on whistling. Bill, looking at letter in his hand. Mrs. Taft's in number four, ain't she? Corrects his mistake. Changes letter to number four. There, that's right. This one is for Mr. Thomas. Turns, as if to go upstage. 
she makes a slight move in that direction he alters his course and makes a wide detour down stage looking at letter in his hand pauses and reads envelope raymond thomas esq mrs jones crosses to left of bill bill have you been drinking bill turns suddenly and breathes in her face thank the lord what's he got to do with it turns and puts thomas's letter in california rack right you know it's way past dinner time if you won't work the least you can do is to be on time for your meals i been working crosses to left speaking as he goes working at what i got the mail the mail came at ten o'clock well i got it was there a letter for you looking into bill's face bill slightly shaking head no bill jones didn't your pension come today still looking at bill bill puts hand in left trousers pocket feeling money not today well when it does come milly's going to buy you some clothes with it i got clothes enough you've got nothing fit to wear in the city when you began calling on me you had good clothes well this is the same suit crosses right toward california desk meets milly milly enters from dining room right leaving door open milly comes to bill oh daddy you're back what of it milly goes to him are you all right bill breathes into her face now are you satisfied milly kisses him do go into your dinner won't you crosses to dining room door milly has saved you something hot crosses close to bill please come up now the girls want to get their work done up i'd a been in there long ago if mother hadn't stopped me milly goes back of desk right glances at nevada desk you and milly go in i'll be there in a moment oh no you march yourself in now points to dining room no what mm, yes exits right enter limel townsend from dining room Bill crosses Lem and exits. Lem gets his hat and portfolio from hat rack. Mrs. Jones goes up California stairs. Call me when the boat comes, Millie. Exit. Yes, ma'am. Back of desk right, looking in letterbox. Lem, with a low bow. Who do I pay? Coming in front of desk right, puts hat and portfolio on desk. Are you only staying for dinner? That's all this trip. Four bits. Cheap enough for that dinner. Gives Millie money. She puts it in drawer under desk. Lem looking about. I never heard of this hotel until a week ago. It's only been running about three months. Well, it's certainly a great idea. Who thought of it? It just happened. How was that? Mother's plan was to just take some boarders, and we didn't get any. But all of a sudden, the women began coming and asking for rooms in Nevada. So we had to put in the Nevada desk and register. Lem looks from one desk to the other. Oh, and now you're all filled up. Nevada's about full, but California's about empty. Well, if I'm elected... Opening portfolio taking out cards your guests will be coming up before me later on i'm running for judge at the next election takes card bearing his picture and vote for lemel townsend for superior judge of the second judicial district hands her one milly looking at card indeed yes i'm on a sort of personally conducted campaign tour do you mind if i tack up a card or two not at all lem taking cards etc to other desk thank you 
crosses around right to hat rack. Puts card just left of it on post of staircase. Enter center, livery man, carrying several bags. Lem goes behind desk and puts up cards right. I drove some folks up from the landing. Goes center, putting two grips by desk left. Oh, the boat's in. Enter center, Mrs. Harper and maid Frida, Everett Haymond and Sheriff Nevin Blodgett. Mrs. Harper is 24 and looks younger. She is pretty, trim little figure and girlish manner. She is a little overdressed, wears a heavy veil, and is much agitated and embarrassed. Frida, the maid, is dressed in dark blue street dress. She is tall and thin but good-looking. She stands helplessly about with her arms full of bundles. Haymond is a large, important man, about forty. His clothes are well-fitting, well-pressed, and a bit flashy. He continually tries to be genial. Sheriff Blodgett is a tall, long-legged, raw-boned, hatchet-faced man. He wears slouch hat and high boots. Mrs. Harper gives livery man money, right of him. Livery man, receiving money for Mrs. Harper. Thank you, marm. I want to pay for two. Livery man, going past him and out center. I'll be back in a minute. I got to help the lame lady. How are you, Mr. Townsend? Crossing down to Lem, right. Hello, Sheriff. They shake hands. Millie, going to Sheriff Center. Do you want to register? Haymond, left of her. No, thanks. We just wanted to find out if... Notices Mrs. Harper. Sheriff turns and looks at Mrs. Harper. Lem sticks card on end of desk and then watches Mrs. Harper. Suppose you attend to the others first. Millie turns to Mrs. Harper, who advances, much embarrassed. Would you like to register? Mrs. Harper looks around at everybody, then crosses down right of Millie. How do you do? I understand. Sees Haymond looking on. I've been told that. Sees Sheriff watching from the other side. Could I speak to you privately? Millie, going to parlor door, left. Opens door. Certainly. Will you come in here? Lem goes back up desk right. Sheriff turns to Lem and makes remark about Mrs. Harper. Turns and goes up right center. Mrs. Harper and Frida exit into parlor. Thank you. Crossing to door left. All right, Frida. Frida picks up bag up left and follows Mrs. Harper off left. Can we hire an automobile here? No, sir, but you can get a team from the liveryman. Thanks. Millie exits left, closing door. Livery man enters with Mrs. Margaret Davis, center. She is on one crutch, and he has her arm. She is right of livery man. They go right down center. Can I get a rig from you? Livery man, holding open door. Not until I get back to the stable. That's soon enough. Come on, Blodgett. Haymond and Sheriff exit center. Haymond points to waterfall as they exit left. Margaret Davis is a woman of thirty, of medium height, pretty, well-formed, well and quietly dressed. Though she is quite independent, she is simple and straightforward, never fresh and seldom slangy. She is on one crutch. Lem turns to watch. Now I'm all right. Thank you. Is this your bag? He turns and picks up bag and puts it on desk left upper end, and drops down left. Yes. Sees Lem. Oh, wait a minute, and I'll get some change from the clerk. Going to desk, opening purse. Will you change five dollars for me? In front of desk, right. Lem laughs, embarrassed. I'm afraid I can't. Well then, pay the busman, please. Turns away. Lem realizing whom she has taken him for. Why, um, uh... 
Margaret looks at him. What's the matter with you? I shall be delighted. He crosses the livery man. How much is it? Four bits. Two bits apiece. Apiece? Two for you and two for your trunk. Oh, I didn't know that you were charging for the crutch. Lem laughs. Margaret stops laughing and glares at Lem. He stops laughing. Lem gives him money. Here you are. Thank you, Marm. Exits up center to the right. Charge that, please. Well, um... I'm Mrs. Davis. Mrs. Margaret Davis. Lem crosses to her as if being introduced. I'm very glad to meet you. My name is Lemuel Townsend, and I... Will you show me my room? I'm afraid I don't know where it is. Why, you were expecting me, weren't you? No, I wasn't. I wrote you I was coming. No, you didn't write to me. You see, I'm only a guest here. Lem joins in the laugh and laughs louder than she, as if it were a great joke. <laughs> and I said... And I took you for the clerk. Yes. And I made you pay the busman. Oh, that was a pleasure. Oh, I couldn't allow that. Just as soon as somebody comes, I'll return it. I hope you'll forgive me. Lem gets chair from up left and puts it center. I'm so glad it happened. Oh, won't you sit down? Offers chair. I'll try, but... Sits. Takes crutch in left hand. Lem moves to her and back and helps her. It's not so easy for me to sit down as it used to be. When seated. There. Now I'm all right till I have to get up again. Will you allow me to introduce myself properly? Sees card on desk and gets it. Permit me my card. Margaret takes card. I'm candidate for judge at the next election. Margaret, looking at card. Oh, really? Turns to him suddenly, handing back card. Where will you be judge? If I'm elected, in Reno. Will you try divorce cases? Oh, yes. Margaret offers hand. Hey, I'm awfully glad to meet you. The pleasure is mutual, believe me. Puts card back on desk, gets chair upright, and brings it down to Margaret's right. Do you intend remaining here long? Sits. I'm in for six months. Oh, I'm very sorry for you, Mrs. Davis, if, uh... Oh, my case doesn't call for sympathy. No? No, congratulations. Oh, it's that way. Yes, and I'd probably never been able to get a divorce if it hadn't been for this. Indicates leg. You don't mean that your husband was brute enough to... Oh, heavens no. This was an accident. Oh, is it, uh, is it serious? I should say it is. Something that will be permanent? Oh no, not so bad as that. Oh. It's a sprain. See? Crosses right, knee over left, puts hand on ankle. Lem, a trifle embarrassed. Uh, I'm very sorry. It's probably all for the best. You see, I'm a dancer. A dancer? Yes, I play vaudeville theater. I've wanted a divorce for years, but I'm always booked solid and never could stay in one place long enough to get one. When this happened, it gave me just the chance I've been looking for. Now I can get a good long rest and my freedom into the bargain. That certainly is a great scheme. It's nice of you to listen to it all. I don't often tell the story of my life. I'm glad you told it to me, because from the moment I saw you walk in that door, I... Uh... Margaret looks at Lamb. But then I was afraid that you... Well, it was a great relief to find that you had two good, uh... Indicates leg. Anyone that has seen me dance can inform you about that. Look at each other and laugh. <laughs> are you stopping here for pleasure, or are you doing time too? I'm a bachelor. 
Margaret looks at him. He smiles. She looks away. How nice. Bill enters from dining room. Oh, here's someone now. Lem rises, moves chair right. Lem helps her to rise. Bill watches as she limps towards him. Are you connected with the hotel? Lem puts his chair upright near desk and crosses to left at back, watching following scene. Rheumatism? No. This is the best climate in the world for rheumatism. Margaret right in front of desk. I'm Mrs. Davis. You're reserving a room for me. Takes pen. How long do you expect to stay? The usual. In front of desk, starting to register. Eh? Six months. Bill takes away pen and crossing to the other desk front of it. This is the six months side over here. Margaret turns. Mrs. Jones enters from upstairs right. She has changed dress and combed hair. Crosses back and to left of Mrs. Davis. Oh, is this Mrs. Davis? Yes. I'm reserving number eight for you. Do you want to go up now? Good heavens, is it up? Only one flight. Turns and sees bag on upper end of desk left. Is this your bag? Yes. Mrs. Jones crosses and gets bag. Goes upstairs left and waits at top. Lem, who has been watching eagerly, to Margaret. Won't you let me help you? Why, thank you very much, Judge. Lem takes crutch, puts left arm about her, and starts for stairs left. I'm not a judge yet. Oh, but you will be. I'm sure of that. She puts her arm on his shoulder, and he assists her. Mrs. Jones stands aside to let them pass. Enter Millie, Mrs. Harper, and Frida. Mrs. Harper starts for California desk. Bill to Mrs. Harper and Frida. Is either of you getting a divorce? Daddy! Goes behind desk left. Well, if they are, they are going to the wrong desk. Mrs. Harper goes to Nevada desk and registers. Will you have my trunk sent up, please? Exits left. Bill? Yes? Bring Mrs. Davis' trunk up to eight right away. It'll be right up there. Mrs. Jones exits up Nevada stairs. All right, Frida. Millie, taking keys from Rack, comes around and up to steps. It's a very small room, but the only one we have left. Millie comes from behind desk and starts upstairs left. Frida has picked up luggage and starts off upstairs left. Bill, reading name and register. Mm, Mrs. Harper, truckee. Mrs. Harper turns and looks at him. Bill, looking up. Does your husband drive a green automobile? Yes. I met him last night. Mrs. Harper looks at Bill in surprise. He's a fast driver, ain't he? Gets to truckee in two hours. Millie from stairs. Will you come up now? Mrs. Harper following her. Thank you. Bill talking to Mrs. Harper as she goes. Yes, sir. He's got a pile of money. Carries it all with him. Millie from landing. Daddy! Mrs. Harper and Frida exit up Nevada stairs. Well, seems like she was making a mistake leaving a man like that. Daddy! Exit. Haymond and Sheriff enter center. How are you? Bill gets center, looking them over. All right. Want to register? Starts for California desk. No, thanks. We're just waiting for a break from the livery stable. Is it too late to get something to eat? Looks toward dining room. The dinner's over. Supper at six. Got a bar? Having one put in next week. Do you want a drink? Where'll I get it? I think I can find you something. Crosses above sheriff to desk left. Good. Gets chair from up left center. Brings it around and sits left of center. Bill, he goes to Nevada desk and looks for flask. 
Heyman gets chair from up left, brings it down right center, and sits. By the way, is there a man stopping here named Raymond Thomas? Oh? Taking letters out of register. I heard there was a Mr. Thomas stopping here. Bill, looking in his pockets. Yeah, he's here. Is he in now? Bill looks behind desk, raises lid of register. I say, do you know if he is here now? Millie enters from Nevada stairs. I know it was here last night. Millie sees Bill hunting. Daddy? Bill slams down register. Sheriff and Haymond rise, remove hats. Sheriff puts his chair left front of counter. He wants to see Mr. Thomas. Millie, crossing to Haymond Center, looks at Haymond interested. He's in his room. Haymond rises. Would you send up my card, please? Takes out card case. They wanted dinner, but I told them it was too late. Bill feels for bottle. I can get you some sandwiches if you'd like them. Well, we are a little hungry, but I don't like to trouble you. Hands Millie card. It isn't a bit of trouble. Daddy, take this card to Mr. Thomas. Gives Bill card. Won't you come in here? She crosses the dining room door right. Haymond and Sheriff follow. Haymond going. That's right nice of you. Come along, Blodgett. He goes. Hangs hat on rack. Sheriff exits the dining room. Hanging hat on rack. I'll try to find you something. Exit right. I've been trying to find them something. Tearing up card. Frida comes down Nevada stairs. Looks about. Frida to Bill. Which way is the kitchen? Through there. Points. Thanks. Turns and goes back to Nevada desk. And again searches in register. Frida exits the kitchen. John, neatly dressed, enters center, watches Bill, before speaking. Front. Bill swings around guiltily, closing register quickly. Hello, Lightning. Bill stands, looking at John in surprise. I never saw you dressed up before. Had your dinner? Yes, Lightning. I can get you some sandwiches. No, thanks. I want to look around. Turns left. Is this the room that's in both states? Bill, pointing. Yes, the state line runs right across there. Points to center line. You're in California and I'm in Nevada. I had no idea you had such a place. Bill, crossing back absentmindedly to Nevada desk. How about a little something to drink? No, nothing, thanks. Sure? No, nothing, Bill. Well, I can't find it anyhow. John crosses to Bill. With a sudden thought, crosses to Register and points at name. John looks at Register. Bill crosses right of John. Mrs. Harper? Just got here. Come for a divorce. How do you know? That's what they all come for. Why, Mr. Harper told me all about that trouble. It's the silliest thing in the world. I wonder if I could talk to her. I tried that. Don't do no good. Frida enters from kitchen. With glass of milk and saucer of crackers on tray. Starts for stairs left. There's her hired girl. John, going toward her. Oh, miss, are you here with Mrs. Harper? Frida, stopping. I am. My name is John Marvin. I'm a friend of Mr. Harper. Will you please ask Mrs. Harper if I may see her for a few minutes? Frida, doubtfully. Yes, sir. I'll ask her. Goes to foot of stairs. Thank you. Lem enters down Nevada stairs. Frida exits. Lem sees Bill. Mrs. Davis is waiting for her trunk. It'll be right up there. Lem crosses to desk right. Picking up hat and portfolio as he goes. John goes to upper end California desk right and puts hat there. Well, hurry it up, will you? She wants to change her dress and I'm going to take her for a buggy ride. Hurries out center off left. Bill starts to sit in chair left center. 
John in chair right center. They're always wanting something. Mrs. Jones enters from Nevada stairs, comes downstairs hurriedly. Bill Jones, where's that lady's trunk? Bill rises. Oh, mother, this is Mr. Marvin. John rises. How do you do, Mrs. Jones? How do you do? To Bill as she goes toward kitchen. Don't you know how long that lady's been waiting for her trunk? It'll be right up there. Crosses and points to chair left. Sit down, John. Mrs. Jones turns at the kitchen door. Well, you get it up there. He turns. Start. Bill, going up center toward porch. Wait here, John. I won't be a minute. Exit center to right. Excuse me. She exits into kitchen. John looks after her in amused surprise. Then turns. Goes to Nevada desk. Millie enters from dining room. Why, Miss Buckley. Millie, seeing him. Mr. Marvin? Goes to him. This is a surprise. They shake hands. Good heavens, you're not married. Married? I, th I thought people came here to get divorced. Oh, <laughs> they do, but I work here. You what? The hotel belongs to my mother and father. Mr. and Mrs. Jones? Yes. Are your mother and father? Well, they're not really, but I've always called them that. I've lived with them ever since I can remember. And I've been seeing lightning for the last month and never knew anything about it. Have you got a camp over on High Ridge? Yes. Why, Daddy's always talking about you, and I hadn't an idea who you were. You haven't given up law, have you? Only for the time being. I was sure you'd never give that up. Why? The way you studied at Mr. Thomas' office. I never saw anyone study so hard. <laughs> Not when you were in the room, I wasn't, because I was looking at you most of the time. Oh, no. If you'd been looking to me, I'd have seen you. Would you? Crosses close to Millie. Both laugh. Millie turns and sits chair right, and John crosses to left of her. Uh-huh. You haven't left Mr. Thomas's office. Why, yes. I left the week after you did. Why? Was there any trouble? Of course not. How could there be any trouble with Mr. Thomas? John. Bringing chair left, to left of Millie, and sitting. Oh, you like Mr. Thomas. Like him very much, don't you? Oh, more than like him. I adore him. Why, he's done everything for me. You've no idea how fine he is. Well, I know a little about him. Oh, yes. He sold some property for your mother, didn't he? Yes, he sold it to the railroad. He'll be awfully glad to see you again. You don't mean Mr. Thomas is here? Yes, he's upstairs packing now. He's leaving by the afternoon boat. He came way up from San Francisco to help me. In what way? Well, Mother had just opened the hotel. He said I ought to go home and see how she was getting on. And I found her in the biggest lot of trouble. What trouble? Why, it seems a big hotel company found out how well she was doing, and they planned to put up a huge hotel just back of us, and Mother was nearly crazy, for she saw that would take away all her business. And you wrote to Mr. Thomas all about it? Yes. And he wrote you he'd do everything in his power to help you? He'd telegraph. Wasn't that just like him? Exactly. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Mr. Thomas could get the hotel company to buy your property and build the big hotel here? You're awfully clever to think of that. That's just what he's done. And they're going to pay enough to make Mother and Daddy comfortable for the rest of their lives. Are they going to pay cash? Oh, it's much better than cash. It shares to their stock. They pay you 10% a year. It's almost too good to be true. John rises. It does, doesn't it? Billy rises. Well, the hotel company telegraphed that they'd take it, and Mr. Thomas is going to fix up all the papers as soon as he gets back to the city. Miss Buckley, I'm afraid that you... Sees Mrs. Jones, who enters from kitchen, and starts for stairs left. Why? 
What is it? I must see Bill for a moment right away, if you'll excuse me. Crosses up to door center. Oh, Mother, this is Mr. Marvin. I've met the gentleman. Yes, Mr. Jones introduced us. Do you know where Daddy is? He went out somewhere after a trunk. My land, ain't he got back with that trunk yet? John to Mrs. Jones. I'll go out and find him. I hope I may see you again, Miss Buckley. I shan't run away. I... I'll be right back. Goes out center, turning to left. Millie comes down to right of Mrs. Jones. Oh, is that for Mrs. Davis? Indicating tray Mrs. Jones brought in. Just to last her till supper time. I'll take it up to her. Crosses to Nevada stairs left. What's that man doing around here? Millie turns to Mrs. Jones. He's an awful nice man, Mother. Why, he's been living near here for over a month, and I didn't know anything about it. Mrs. Jones crosses to Millie. Why should you? He's one of Bill's cronies, ain't he? Yes, but I met him in Mr. Thomas's office. Oh, the poor young man that studied so hard and that you were so sorry for? I thought there was more to that story than you ever let on. Millie starts up Nevada stairs. Why, I'll hardly know Mr. Marvin. Goes upstairs, exits. Mrs. Jones crosses the stairs, calling after her. It looked to me as though you knew each other pretty well. Enter Bill with trunk on his back. Mrs. Jones turns and sees Bill with trunk. Do you realize how long that lady's been waiting for her trunk? I realize it's heavy. Going up steps. Mrs. Jones, scolding, but really afraid of trunk's weight. Oh, well, don't try to take it up if it's too much for you. Bill turns and comes down to her. Oh, it's easy when you know how. Just a knack. Did you see that Mr. Marvin out there? No. Well, I don't want him hanging around here, Bill. John's all right. Starts upstairs. I won't have him here. I've got my reasons. Exits into kitchen. Mrs. Harper enters from top of stairs left as Bill gets to top step with trunk. Mrs. Harper almost running into Bill. Ow! Oh. Excuse me. Comes down steps into center. Mrs. Harper comes down. Does a Mr. Marvin want to see me? Yes. Just wait there in the parlor, and I'll send him to you in a minute. Mrs. Harper goes into the parlor. Bill starts up the stairs again. John enters center from left. Oh, Bill, I want to see you right away. Comes down center. Throws chair left up center. Mrs. Harper's in the parlor. Coming downstairs to left of John. I'll see her in a minute. Bill, they're trying to rob you. Wait a minute. Puts trunk on desk left. Turns to John. What did you say? They're trying to rob you, Bill. Bill, taking money out of left pocket. No, they ain't. Listen, Bill, this man Thomas is trying to cheat you out of your place. Mr. Thomas? Yes, Mr. Thomas. What makes you think that? I'm sure of it. The stock he's going to give you isn't worth a dollar. What can I do about it? The place belongs to Mother. Oh. Well, tell Thomas your wife won't consider selling until you consult your lawyer. Then I'll talk to him. Bill gets trunk on his back again at desk left. What'll I tell him? that you won't sell until you consult your lawyer. I'd have told him that anyway. Crosses up stage and goes upstairs left. Good. Now I've got to see Mrs. Harper. Bill, at top of stairs, leaning over railing. Oh, John, what makes you think that about Thomas? Because he's the man who cheated me out of my property and sold it to the railroad. Exits into parlor left and Thomas enters on stairs right. Bill stands on landing, looking at Thomas. Oh, Bill, 
I want to see you for a minute. Can't you see me from there? Thomas looks up at him. Why? What's the matter? Puts hat and coat on desk right. Crosses to left. Can't tell you till I consult my lawyer. Exit Bill. Enter Mrs. Jones from kitchen. So, you are all ready to go? Yes, all ready. I'd like to have a little talk with you, if you don't mind. Why, certainly not, Mrs. Jones. Comes down left of Mrs. Jones. There's something that's worrying me, and I just wanted to speak to you about it. Why, then? Do so by all means. Well, I've had an idea that you are... <laughs> well, that you're fond of Millie. Oh, fond of her? <laughs> I should say I am. And I know that Millie is very fond of you, and I've been wondering if there was any reason why you hadn't told each other about it. Oh, well, I guess Millie doesn't see me in that light. Do you think she sees Mr. Marvin in that light? Marvin? Ain't that the name of the man you had in your office? Why, yes. Yes, I did have a John Marvin in my office for a short time. Ha has Millie talked to you about him? It's not what Millie said. Looks at Thomas. It's the way he looked at her. A blind man could see he was in love with her. He, he was here? He's here now. Where? Mrs. Jones, pointing out center. Outside there, somewhere. Thomas, going to door up center. Moving chair as he goes. I'd no idea that fellow had been coming here. Oh, I don't think he has ever been here before. Thomas, coming down. Mrs. Jones, I think it only fair to tell you this Marvin is not a proper person for her to see. I thought he was a splendid fellow when I took him into my office, and I could hardly believe it when I found out the sort of a man he really is. What sort is he? Why, he's in with a gang that goes about the country stealing timber. <gasps> Mercy on us. Millie comes down Nevada stairs. Oh, Mr. Thomas. Thomas, cautioning Mrs. Jones. Shh. Did you see the man that was waiting for you? Crosses to Thomas. No. Millie, crossing to dining room door. Oh, dear. I sent Daddy up to you with his card. As she exits into dining room. Mr. Thomas is here now. Thank you. A moment's pause. Then enter Haymond. Is this Mr. Thomas? Crosses to Thomas. Yes, sir? My name is Hammond, Everett Hammond. How do you do, Mr. Hammond? Excuse me. Thomas, to Mrs. Jones. Oh, I shall see you before I go, Mrs. Jones? Oh, yes. Exits in the kitchen. Thomas, after looking around. What's up? I'm on my way over to that Marvin fellow's place. The railroad sent a sheriff after him yesterday, but he couldn't get him, so they told me I'd better come along with the sheriff and see what I could do. I thought I'd stop here and see you first, because I don't know whether it's a good idea to jail Marvin or not. Why not? He'll squeal, won't he? He can't prove anything, and if he talks, he'll do more harm out of jail than he will in. Where's the sheriff? In the dining room. Well, you don't need to go over to Marvin's camp. Why? Because he's here. Here? He? Does he know anything about our buying the hotel? I don't know. You've got it, haven't you? Well, they've agreed to sell. Then you'd better have it transferred to me right away. That's what I was going to do. Now, call in the sheriff and... Payment crosses toward door. Millie enters, crosses to Thomas. Oh, Millie, will you tell your mother that Mr. Hammond of the Golden Gate Land Company is here? She's in the kitchen. I'll get her. Exits into kitchen. Thomas takes chair up left. 
Ready, Blodgett? Crosses to rack right, gets hat. Yes, yeah, just waiting for you. Sheriff enters, closes door, and gets hat. Sheriff, this is Mr. Thomas. How do you do? How are you? He tells me your man is here. Sheriff to Thomas. Where? Looks at Haymond, then to Thomas. He's apt to come in that door any minute. You wait for him out there and don't let him in this room. Huh. You see, if you nabbed him in the house, it might cause a lot of talk. Oh. Starts up, turns to Thomas. How I know him. I'll pawn him out to you. Mrs. Jones enters with Millie. Mrs. Jones comes down right center. Sheriff exits center, looks right, and walks left, then across right. This is Mr. Hammond, Mrs. Jones, and Miss Berkeley. How do you do? Pleased to meet you. How do you do? Mr. Hammond represents the Golden Gate Land Company, and he tells me they are ready to take over this place at once. Enter Bill on stairs. You mean you want to have us leave right away? Oh, that isn't necessary. But we prefer to have the transfer made so that we can take over the management immediately. You've no objection to that, have you, Mrs. Jones? Bill starts downstairs. Sheriff crosses left center window with back to audience. Stands there. Certainly not. Looking at Thomas. Crosses to Haymond. I want to leave the whole matter in Mr. Thomas' hands, and I'll do anything he advises me to. Then we'll give you a deed this afternoon, Mr. Hammond. Bill comes down left of Thomas. Hold on, Thomas. We ain't going to sell the hotel until I consult my lawyer. Bill, do be quiet. What in the world's the matter with you? Enter John from down left. Mother, they're trying to rob you. Bill! Daddy! Mrs. Jones crosses to Bill. You apologize for saying such a thing to Mr. Thomas. Bill turns up to desk at left. John comes to Mrs. Jones. There's no need for an apology, Mrs. Jones. Bill's right. Thomas goes up to door center, beckons the sheriff and points to John. So it's you who's been putting Bill up to this? Now I know all about you, and I don't want any of your advice. She goes up to kitchen door. John follows her upright. Mrs. Jones, you... Sheriff enters left, meets John up center. Is your name John Marvin? John turns and eyes Sheriff for a moment. Don't interrupt me now. Comes down center, California side. Sheriff follows down Nevada side. You better not get fresh with me. That's the man you're after, Sheriff. I got a warrant for your arrest. Oh! John to Sheriff. I can't be bothered with you just now. Now I... None of y'all, Lip. Now come along. Grabs John. They are right on the state line. John throwing him back. Take your hands off me. Throw Sheriff to Nevada side. He stays on California side. Now you're worse off than you was before, resisting an officer of the law. Taking handcuffs from left coat pocket, starts for John. Law? Don't you know any more about law than to try and serve me with a Nevada warrant when I'm in California? By Jiminy, he's right. Ring curtain. John, as curtain descends... Now understand, Bill, they can't get a good title to this place without your signature, so don't you sign any paper till you see what they're after. Starts for Bill, crosses line. Sheriff starts for John. Bill motions for John to get back as curtain comes down. All exit quickly except Bill and Sheriff. Haymond, Mrs. Jones, and Thomas exit center and to right. John exits kitchen. Billy exits kitchen. Bill goes back of desk left. Sheriff goes up, takes Bill's hat up, puts it on hook with code, brings small table down center, 
goes back up stage. Curtain. End of Act One, Scene One. Act One, Scene Two of Lightning by Winchell Smith and Frank Bacon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act One. Scene two. Scene. Same as scene one. Moonlight outside. Lamps on stage lighted. Curtain down one minute. Mrs. Starr enters from parlor living room. Takes chairs from front of stairs left. Places it down center. Back to audience. Sits. She has eight quarters. Mrs. Moore enters from Nevada stairs. Gets chair from foot of Nevada stairs. Places at back of table, facing front. Sits. Mrs. Moore brings the bridge scores and pencil and cards. Mrs. Jordan enters from parlor left. Brings chair front parlor and bridge score. Places chair left of table. Sits. Mrs. Preston enters from dining room, followed by Mrs. Cogshall. Mrs. Preston gets chair at California desk, places it right of table, sits. Mrs. Cogshall crosses back of table to left of Mrs. Moore, watching game. Livery man enters center, puts coat and hat on chair right of door center, sits on them. Sheriff stands talking to him. Bill is behind Nevada desk, getting out keys. The ladies are adding up the bridge score as curtain rises. I make it thirty-one cents. Adding up on card. That's correct. Mrs. Starr puts chair up stage left at Nevada desk left. Mrs. Jordan takes chair up left of door center, goes to foot of Nevada stairs. Mrs. Cogshall crosses and goes up to top of Nevada stairs. As Mrs. Jordan goes up with chair, Mrs. Preston crosses and follows Mrs. Cogshall upstairs. Mrs. Jordan follows Mrs. Preston up. Mrs. Starr follows Mrs. Moore, and Mrs. Jordan follows Mrs. Starr. I'm through for tonight. Sheriff, delivery man. Then I can't get back tonight. Not unless I drive you over. What'll that cost? Eight dollars. I'll wait and take the train back in the morning. Mrs. Cogshall from stairs. Good night, Mr. Jones. Exits left. Good night, Mr. Good Jones. Night, Mr. Good Jones. night, Mr. Jones. Good night, Mr. Jones. Good night, good night. All ladies exit. Bill comes from behind Nevada desk left. Takes chair. Puts it at Nevada desk left and table up left of door center. Jim, keep an eye on that fellow, will you? Sure. Exit center and to left. Bill crosses to kitchen door upright. Wraps on it. John enters from kitchen. Sheriff's just gone out, but he's going to stay here all the night. John crosses in front of Bill, looks through window. Has Thomas said anything more to you? No. But he and the other fella have been talking to Mother. Where are they now? In the dining room, going over the books. Is your wife with them? No. Nah, she's up in her room with that lame lady. You won't sign that deed, will you, Bill? Not unless you tell me to. That's right. They don't care about this hotel. They want the property for some other reason, and I've got to find out what that reason is. I can find that out for you. How? I used to be a detective. Did you tell Miss Buckley I hadn't gone? She ain't been down since supper. I must see her before I go, Lightning. I must. Livery man enters from left through door center. Look out, he's coming back. Goes down left to Nevada desk. Bill to John. Go in there. I'll let you know the minute she comes down. John exits quickly into kitchen. 
Sheriff enters center from left, looks at Bill, closes door, sits right of table up left center. Livery man crosses up to Sheriff, takes Bill's coat and hat from hook back of curtain left, puts them on table. Livery man and Sheriff cut cards that have been left on table by the ladies. Thomas enters from dining room, down right, with small account books, goes behind California desk right, leaves books, gets papers. Bill comes left of counter right. I thought you was going away this afternoon. You prevented that, and you nearly spoiled your wife's chances of selling this place. Making notation on papers. Well, I'm not going to do anything till I consult my lawyer. Oh, he calls himself a lawyer, does he, eh? He is a lawyer. The smartest lawyer on the coast. Thomas, smiling. Are you trying to hurt my feelings, Bill? No, I mean the smartest, honest lawyer. Thomas scowls at Bill, then recovers himself. Well, you go up and tell your wife, Mr. Hammond, and I want to see her. Exit store down right, taking papers with him. Tell her yourself. Bill sits in chair, just right of center. Lem comes to center door, enters, comes down center of Bill. Lem to Bill. Do you know who Mrs. Davis is? Yep, she's the lame lady. Well, will you go up and tell her that Mr. Townsend's been waiting for her for over an hour? That won't do no good. What? She's got another one now. Another one? Mr. Thomas, he's cut you out. He grabbed her the minute you brought her back from the buggy ride. Livery man, who has been watching this, laughs and goes left. Lem turns up center, sees livery man, comes down left. Are you the livery man? Yes, sir. I want my horse hitched up. You said you were going to stay overnight. I changed my mind. Livery man takes hat and coat from chair right of door, coming down left of Bill. Who the devil is Mr. Thomas? If you want to get even with him, I'll send him out to you. Bill goes behind counter right. Sheriff comes down left. Say you going to drive to Reno tonight, Mr. Townsend? Yep. You want to come along? Thanks. I'd like to. Lem goes up center. Harper enters quickly center. He carries bag. Lem exits after he's on. Harper, delivery man. Do you know where I can find Mr. Marvin? Sheriff, hears Harper say Marvin, turns to him, comes down left of Harper. Was that? Who do you want to find? Harper turns to Sheriff. John Marvin. I got a telegram from him and I want to see him. He's gone. Sheriff to Bill. Yes, he has. How are you, Mr. Harper? Oh, why, well, hello, Mr. Jones. Sheriff to livery man. Come along, I'll help you hitch up. Sheriff starts out, followed by livery man. They exit center to right. How do you do, Mr. Harper? Bill, shaking his hand, looking around cautiously. John's here, but they don't know it. Where's Mrs. Harper? Bill, pointing left. In Nevada. What? I told her I thought you'd be here. What'd she say? Bill, after glancing at him. Guess I better not tell you. It ain't encouraging. Harper moves chair up, sits limply right center. Of all the damn fool things. I wouldn't call her that. Harper rises. Who's calling her that? I mean, what happened? It was all a mistake. Why don't you tell her? Harper, up center and back to Bill. She wouldn't believe it. Same trouble I have. Folks don't believe nothing I tell them neither. Why don't you write it to her? Good idea. Can I get a room? Bill, behind California desk. All you want on this side. Just register. Harper puts bag down right, front of desk. 
Registering. Where's the bar? Down to the saloon. Never mind, I got a flask in my bag. Bill, picking up bag with alacrity, starts for California stairs. I'll show you right up. Bill knocks on kitchen door. To Harper. John wants to see you. What's that? Millie enters down Nevada stairs. Millie, come right down. Seeing her. Up in number four, at the end of the hall. Pushes Harper up California stairs. Bill stops, looks at John and Millie from balcony. Harper exits. Bill follows him. Millie leaves stairs and starts down toward dining room door. John enters from kitchen, steps in her way, down center right of her. Miss Buckley. Millie looks at him, a moment's pause. I suppose you're surprised to find me still here. I don't think anything you could do would surprise me after what happened today. That's what I've waited to explain. I couldn't go without telling you why I tried to stop that sale. I don't care to hear it. Mr. Thomas is the best friend I have in the world, and I won't listen to a word against him. But Mrs. Jones is being cheated, robbed. I don't believe it. I'll never believe it. And I can't see how this concerns you anyway. It concerns me because... Well, because I care for you. Why didn't you tell me what you suspected when you first saw me today? Well, you see, you told me how much you thought of him. I hadn't realized before that you... Do you mean I told you I loved Mr. Thomas? That's what I understood. Oh, you're always wrong. You... you mean you don't love him? Billy, turning back to John. I told you he was my best friend. I never said I loved him. Well, say it now. I mean, say you don't, and then give me time. I'll find out what their game is. Millie, coming to John's... Oh, I don't want you to find out, because I know you're mistaken. You can't prevent Mother selling, because she is sold already. Only, they won't pay her for it until they have Daddy's name. They shan't have that. Millie turns away from him to left. So that's it. But don't you see... Millie, turning back to John. Yes, I see now. You're doing all this just to hurt Mr. Thomas. He told you that. Yes, he did. John, coming close to Millie. Just the same. I'll never let Bill sign that deed if I can prevent it. And someday, you'll thank me for it. Thank you. I'll always hate and despise you. Always, always, always. I hope I shall never see you again. And if I do... I'll never notice you or speak to you the longest day I live. Sheriff comes in center. Look out, John! John jumps over to California's side as Sheriff comes down and tries to catch him. Thank you, Miss Buckley. You saved me. Millie rushes up the Nevada stairs. And, Miss Buckley, I shall be grateful to you always, always, always. Millie exits. John goes up to center door to Sheriff. I'm on my own side, Sheriff. Exit center to left. Sheriff runs for door, tries to catch John as he jumps left and disappears. Bill, a bit worse for liquor, enters from California stairs coming down. Sheriff comes back center and closes door. Sheriff to Bill. That fellow hadn't gone after all. Mind your business. Say you're collecting something, ain't you? I didn't get nothing from you. Don't get sore. I wish I was in your place. Sheriff sits up left. Thomas enters from dining room. Bill starts for Nevada stairs left. In my place? You're like that other fella. Indicates Thomas. Thomas goes back of California desk right. Consulting paper. Did you tell your wife we are waiting for her? No, I didn't. I've been up visiting my friend, Mr. Harper. To Sheriff. Big millionaire, having trouble with his wife. I got him to write this note and I'm going to deliver it. He gave me this bottle for the idea. Holding up bottle, Bill goes up Nevada stairs, exits. Margaret and Mrs. Jones enter from California stairs. 
Mrs. Jones in evening gown. Margaret is carrying crutch in her left hand. Mrs. Jones has her arm around Margaret's waist, helping her. Oh, Mr. Thomas, look who's here. Thomas sees Mrs. Jones, comes from behind desk to front of it. Well, upon my word, what does this mean? It means she's been fixing me up in one of her theater dresses. No, Mrs. Jones, you know you wanted to put it on. Well, I didn't want to come down here in it. She's been so worried about how she was going to look when she gets to San Francisco that I dressed her up in this. Why, you look stunning. Well, I feel foolish. Well, you've no reason to. Goes and opens door, right? Of course you haven't. Mrs. Jones looks at Margaret. Do you know, Mr. Hammond, and I've been waiting for you for an hour? Mrs. Jones crossing to Thomas. I'm sorry. To Margaret. It's the business about the hotel. Will you excuse me? Exits right. Of course. Goes to Thomas. Lem enters center. Comes down stage watching Thomas and Margaret. Thomas goes to Margaret. It's mighty nice of you to go to all this trouble, Mrs. Davis. I appreciate it a lot. Don't speak of it. I've enjoyed it immensely. Sheriff rises and comes down to judge. Is the team ready, Mr. Townsend? Thomas exits right. Margaret goes above chair center to Lem. Why, Judge, you're not going. Sheriff exits center. Yes. Why, you said you'd wait until tomorrow. I've changed my mind. But I haven't seen you all evening. Lem coming to her. Oh, have you noticed that? But I'd no idea you were leaving tonight. And there are so many things I wanted to talk to you about. Oh, don't go just yet. Please, Judge. Hands him crutch. We'll go out on the porch. Takes his arm and leads him up. It wouldn't be at all nice to go without even saying goodbye. They exit center and left. Bill enters Nevada stairs, comes down. As they exit, Bill closes door center, comes to bottom of Nevada stairs, calls up Nevada stairs. Well, Mrs. Harper, Mrs. Harper. Mrs. Harper appears top of Nevada stairs, wearing kimono. He's in number four. Hurry now before anybody sees you. Mrs. Harper comes down, crosses to foot of California stairs. Mrs. Harper going to Bill right of him. Do they all know he's my husband? No, I won't say nothing about it. He's in number four. Hurry before somebody sees you. Bill goes right, leans on counter. Mrs. Harper goes up California stairs and exits. Hammond enters from dining room, with books and papers, goes behind California desk. Sheriff enters center. This is a hard place to get away from. Now that the rig's ready, that woman's got towns and out there buzzing him like a Dutch uncle. Turns up, looks off left, through window. Bill to Hammond. Oh, you run in the place now? Sheriff brings chair left of center. Well, I've just settled everything with your wife, and all that's needed now is for you to sign that deed. I'll take a drink with you. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't got anything. Bill takes out bottle. I have. You look as if you've had enough. Oh, I don't want it for myself. It's just sociability. I don't drink. Don't tell me that. You're a booze fighter. Sits. No, I ain't. I'm an Indian fighter. Is that so? Yes, that's so. Did you ever know Buffalo Bill? Yes, I knew him well. Bill turns, takes a good look at him. I learned him all he knew about killing Indians. Sits right center. Did he ever tell you about the duel I fought with Settin' Bull? Settin' Bull? He was standing when I shot him. I never took advantage of nobody, not even a Indian. Say, you got a 
bee in your bonnet, ain't you? What do you know about bees? Not much, do you? Yes, I do. I know all about them. I used to be in the bee business. Why, I drove a swarm of bees across the plains in the dead of winter and never lost a bee. Got stung twice. Sheriff rises. I got enough. Sheriff replaces his chair, upright of desk left, and exits center. I'm going out and sit in the buggy. Now look here, Mr. Jones. Won't do no good. I promised John not to sign nothing, and I ain't going to sign nothing. Understand that? Well, if you don't, you'll find yourself without a home. Enter Mrs. Jones and Thomas Wright. He stops at lower end of desk, and Mrs. Jones crosses to Nevada desk left. You understand that if you're not too drunk. Do you think I'm drunk? Turns, sees Mrs. Jones crossing to left, thinks she is one of the guests, rises, crosses to Mrs. Jones. Do you want your key? Mrs. Jones turns with key in one hand and pen in the other. Bill recognizes her. Mother, it ain't you? Yes, it's me. Bill to Haymond. You're right. I'm drunk. Thomas, suddenly assuming pleasant manner. Don't you approve, Lightning? Why, she's dressed in a height of fashion. Looks higher than that to me. Mrs. Jones starts for door down right. Mosquitoes will give you hell in that this summer. Oh! Exits quickly into dining room, slamming door. Thomas, going up California stairs, speaking to Bill. You'll get yourself disliked around here if you don't look out. So will you. No way your room is, Mr. Hammond? Yes. Good night. Good night. Exits. Hammond to Bill. See here, Jones. I've taken over the management of this place, and I don't propose to stand any more nonsense from you. And unless you do as your wife tells you to, I'll kick you out of here. No, you won't. What's the reason I won't? Cause you talk too much about it. Payment, going up California stairs. You'll see whether I will or not. He exits. Mrs. Jones enters from dining room. Comes slowly toward Bill, with deed and pen still in her hand. Mother, ain't you cold? Mrs. Jones, almost in tears. No. I'm hot all over at your insulting me before those gentlemen. <laughs> Make em fun of me because I tried to look presentable for once in my life. Bill goes to her, puts hand on her arm. It's getting late, mother. You're tired. You've been working hard. You're all tuckered out. Now you go upstairs and put on some clothes and go to bed. Oh, you ought to be ashamed of yourself with that gentleman here to buy the place and you around the office drinking liquor. No, I ain't. Mrs. Jones pulls flask from his pocket. That belongs to Mr. Harper. You can go up and ask him if you don't believe it. Puts it on California desk. Opens deed. Holds it out in front of him. Now I want you to put your name to this paper. I can't, Mother. What's the reason you can't? Because I promised. Now see here, Bill. I've been working my fingers to the bone for years, and now that I've sold the place, I'm entitled to a rest and you shan't stop me having it. Mr. Thomas is taking Millie and me to San Francisco tomorrow, and if you'll sign that, he'll bring you with us. If you don't, you'll have to look out for yourself a while. Bill pauses, points upstairs right. That fella said he'd throw me out. Do you want me to get out, mother? Is that what you mean? I mean just that, Bill. All right, I'll go. <laughs> go where? I'll be all right. Well, I mean every word I've said, Bill. She goes to foot of California stairs. It's one thing or the other. Going up the stairs. 
either you make up your mind to sign this or i'm through with you exits bill gets his hat and coat from table up left center comes to desk at right picks up flask looks upstairs right changes his mind sets it back on desk goes to door center opens it turns and looks at flask goes back and gets it puts it in his pocket exits center and left closing door behind him curtain end of act one scene two Act Two, Part One of Lightning by Winchell Smith and Frank Bacon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene: A courtroom in Reno, Nevada. The judge's bench is at right door at back of it in right flat. This platform and door is about three feet high. There is a door down right below this. There are four steps coming down at lower end of Judge's platform. At the lower downstage side of Judge's platform, there is a small desk and six-inch platform for the clerk of the court. Just right of center upstage is the witness box on a two-foot platform. A railing runs from the witness box to the left wall with a gate left of center. Just left of center and railing, there is a break-up enough for the sheriff's chair at left. Up and down stage in two rows, there are ten chairs for witnesses. There are two windows in left flat, one up and one down stage. There is a large old-fashioned stove with a long stovepipe going to the ceiling just back of rail left. At back there are two rows of benches, one in front of the other, Fourteen feet long. These are up back of railing. Down left of center, there is a large table with legal papers on it, and two law books and a Reno newspaper. There is a chair at left end, one in front and one in back of table. There are three chairs in front of judge's bench. Between judge and witness stand, there is a small desk on platform for court stenographer. There is a large office clock on center of back wall, one over door right, one over door left center. There are two brackets at back, one right, one left. A bracket down left between windows. A chandelier hangs in the center of ceiling. At rise of curtain, Sheriff slouched down in chair, his feet on lawyer's table, is reading Reno News. Miss Emily Jarvis enters. She is an old maid of forty to forty-five, medium size, quiet, and businesslike. Not exaggerated character part. Though she takes an interest in all that goes on in court, her mind is constantly on her own work. A nice, good-natured, matter-of-fact woman with a sense of humor. She enters left center in a businesslike way, carries a roll of papers and a bunch of flowers. Good morning, Nevin crosses to her desk, upright center. Sheriff, looking up from paper. Hello, Emily. Goes back to paper. Emily puts paper and flowers on her chair. My, but it's stuffy in here. Sheriff snaps paper closed, looks up. Why don't you let in a little fresh air? It's lovely and warm outside. She crosses, taking off wraps and exits down right, leaving door open. Sheriff pays no attention till she is gone. Then he looks about, sniffs as though to test the air's freshness, and throws open the two windows, upstage left first, then down left, and grumbling. No chance to read the papers. Why don't they get a man's stenographer? Meanwhile, Walter Lennon enters from upright the judge's room, and puts papers on judge's desk. He is short, chunky, and genial. Walter, go on behind clerk's desk. What are you doing, Sheriff? Playing freeze out? Sheriff scowls at him. Miss Jervis says it's stuffy in here. A courtroom is supposed to be stuffy. 
Well, if it gets too cold, I'll shut em before court opens. Sits in chair, front of table. Emily re-enters without wraps, bringing two glasses of water. Emily, noticing windows. Ah, that's better, Nevin. Closes door, goes to her desk up right of center. Walter, coming down steps to clerk's desk. Morning, Emily. Good morning, Walter. Sits, puts glasses on rail of witness stand. Walter crosses up to Emily. Have you noticed the first case on the list this morning? Glances at Sheriff. Places list on clerk's desk, glancing at it. No. Takes paper cuffs from side of desk, puts them on. Walter, winking at her and nodding at Sheriff. Pacific Railroad Company versus John Marvin. Sheriff pretends to be much absorbed in paper. What of it? Why, you've heard of Marvin, haven't you? Glancing at Sheriff. Not that I remember. Well, about six months ago, they got a warrant out for his arrest and sent a sheriff after him. They told the sheriff to be careful because his man was a pretty slippery customer, but he was a smart sheriff and said that was just the kind he liked to tackle. Then he got handcuffs and a gun and everything and went out and nabbed the fellow in great style. The only mistake was that it was a Nevada sheriff and he tried to grab his man in California. Did you ever hear of that case, Nevin? Goes right, laughing. Oh, shut up. Walter laughs. Oh, Nevin, were you the sheriff? <laughs> sheriff swings around. Yes, I was the sheriff. Emily crosses up stage to her desk, covers drinking glass with card, puts it on judge's desk, puts flowers in the other glass, and puts that up. It happened six months ago, and it looks as if I'd never hear the last of it. Rises. How was I going to know he was on the other of the state line? Walter laughs. Sheriff up, crosses center to Walter. Go on, laugh. But it may not be so funny before I get through. Why? What you going to do? His kiss is coming up today, and they're got his property attached. If he don't show up, they'll get a judgment. And if he does show up... Turns. Well, I still got that warrant. Indicates inside of pocket. Starts to read paper. But you can't arrest a man in the courtroom. I know I can't. Now, don't try to tell me the law. Looks into paper. I can rest him outside the courtroom. Yes, but you've got to be in here. Goes to clerk's desk. Oh, have I? You wait and see. Turns right. Teddy, a newspaper reporter, enters up left center, comes through gate to left of Sheriff. Hello, Sheriff. Lo, Teddy. Well, did you see it? Yes, I just been reading it. Looks at paper. What do you think of it? Fine. I don't care anything about having my name in the paper, but it tickles my wife to death. <laughs> oh, that's all right. But say... Turns to Sheriff. You come across a good story. You know me. Teddy crosses up to Emily... She puts a flower in his buttonhole. Bet your life I won't forget. Thomas enters from outside, comes with an air of importance, puts his books, etc., on table center. How do, Mr. Thomas? Good morning, Sheriff. Goes right, crosses to clerk right. Good morning, Miss Jarvis. Good morning, Mr. Thomas. How do you do? How are you, Lennon? Mrs. Cogshaw and Mrs. Starr enter and go to front visitor's bench center. Sheriff meets them at gate and points to visitor's bench right. They cross and sit there. Sheriff sits with back to audience at his desk and reads paper. Good morning. Smiles. Have you got the list? 
Yes, your case is first. Picks up list. Which one? I've got two today. Railroad versus Marvin is first. Good. When is my d -boss case? Two men enter. One stops by door. The other comes down stage, looks around, and they both go and sit in back row. Teddy goes and sits in back row and talks to ladies in front of him. Which is it? There are four here. Jones is mine. Jones versus Jones, that's third. Thanks. Crosses down left to Sheriff. Sheriff. Yes? Sheriff comes to meet him left. That Marvin case is on first this morning. I know it is. I'm going to use you as a witness. You gonna bring out that story of my serving the warrant? No, I don't think we'll have to go into that. Don't if you can help it. But I want to ask you about the time you went to my van's camp. Oh, that's all right. I want to show when he was taking down the timber. I'm going to ask you what time you were there. The date, I mean. I didn't get out where the timber was. But you know he had a gang of wood choppers there. Yes. And they drove you off by force? Yes. And you remember the date? Yes. Thomas goes to above table and gets paper out of portfolio and sits. Good. That's all I need. Sheriff goes up to gate, turns to Thomas. You don't think Marvin will be here, do you? I don't care whether he is or not. The case is a cinch. I got a notion he won't be here. Not in here. Say, Walter, look out for things till court opens, will you? And if I'm wanted, let me know. Where are you going? I'll be just outside the door. Going to gate. Oh, going to lay for Marvin out there, are you? Never mind what I'm going to do. Walter crosses back to his desk and sits writing. Hammond, Mrs. Jones, and Millie enter from outside. Sheriff holds the gate for them. This is the way. Starts down left, Mrs. Jones following. Thomas turns and sees them. Oh, good morning. I'm glad to see you. Come right in. Millie goes to him right center. How fine you look, Millie. I don't feel that way. Oh, the trial won't amount to anything. How are you, Mrs. Jones? She has turned and followed Millie. Hammond comes around in front of the table. Well, I'm here. Mrs. Jones is a mighty brave woman, Thomas. You can't tell me anything about Mrs. Jones. To her? It's like going to the dentist's. The worst part is making up your mind to do it. I tell her that she'll be in a much better position to find her husband and tell him after the divorce is over and she gets the money from the place. Of course. No doubt of that. Oh, this is the only thing to do, Mrs. Jones. I know it's for the best. You haven't heard anything of Daddy? No, we haven't been able to locate him. I wonder where he can be. Your case is forth. It will be some time before they get to it. Two men enter, come to gate, then sit in front row, extreme right of bench. Oh, dear. But you needn't wait here. Turns to Lennon. Lennon, my clients and her friends can wait in there, can't they? Walter, opening door down right. Certainly, Mr. Thomas. Just step right in here, Mrs. Jones, Millie. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. They exit right. You better go too, Hammond. In a lower tone as Hammond turns, disgusted. Keep them cheered up. That's about all I've been doing for the last six months. He follows the woman off right. Thank you, Lannon. Not at all. Closes door. Sheriff opens door up left. Mrs. Davis enters, crosses to sit in visitor's bench. Sheriff opens gate. This way. Margaret comes through gate, crosses to clerk's desk, speaks to him. 
Could I see Judge Townsend? Not till after court. Oh. Are you party to a case? Yes. Then just take a seat over there, please. Points to chairs left. Margaret starts for left, sees Thomas. Oh, Mr. Thomas. Thomas crosses below table to Margaret's center. Yes? Don't you remember me? Why, yes, Mrs. Davis, isn't it? Sheriff enters up left center, glances at them, looks off door. Yes. They shake hands. You were on crutches the last time I saw you. Have you quite recovered? Oh, long ago. Does your case come up today? Yes, and I'm worried sick about it. Do you think I could see Lemuel, uh, I mean the judge, for a moment? I'm afraid not just now. Is there anything I can do? Teddy comes round and sits in front row. I don't know. My lawyer's sick. Well, you ought to see a doctor about that. I have. That is, the doctor telephoned me and said he couldn't allow him to come to court. And if I could only tell the judge... Why, there's nothing to worry about. You can explain to the judge when your case is called, and he'll postpone it. Sheriff glances at them. But I don't want to have it postponed. A courtroom scares me to death, and now I'm here I want to get it over. Well, I'd be very glad to represent you if you care to have me. Sheriff shows amusement and listens. Oh, could you? Certainly, delighted. There's nothing to your case anyhow. The judge is a friend of yours, isn't he? Sheriff looks out door. Oh, yes, he's a... well... That is, I know him. Then don't give it another thought. Just leave everything to me. Crosses to table left, gets paper. That does take a load off my mind. If anything went wrong after waiting all these months, I'd die, that's all. Thomas goes right to door. Sheriff comes through gate to left of chair at back of table. Stands. No chance of that. Mrs. Jones and Millie are here. Are they? Where? In the next room. Come in and say hello to them, won't you? Opens door. Margaret stops. But I want to be here when I'm called. Oh, they won't get to you for quite a while. Another case of mine goes on first. Opens door. Right in here. I'm certainly glad I ran into you. She goes, followed by Thomas. Off stage. Why, how do you do? Thomas closes door. See, Teddy, I got your story. What's up? Comes through gate to sheriff. Did you notice that woman? The one that got Thomas take a case? Watch the judge when he hears that Thomas is to be her lawyer. Why? Judge Townsend's crazy about her and thinks Thomas is trying to steal her away from him. Good, thanks. Don't say I said anything about it. Sure I won't. Crosses up to rail between witness chair and sheriff's chair. One man and one woman enter, sit in back room. John jumps through window up left. Oh! Emily screams, rises. Walter, going toward him to gate, holds it so John can't get through. Here, what are you doing? John, trying to get through gate. I've got business here. Then wouldn't it be just as handy for you to come in through the door? I'm afraid not. I saw someone there I didn't want to meet. Oh, is your name Marvin? Yes, John Marvin. The sheriff's out there with the warrant, waiting for you. So I noticed. Come in. Opens gate. Thanks. Hide over there. Points to chairs down left. Stands laughing. John goes down left. Teddy goes through gate and sits in back row of visitors' bench. Harper, Mrs. Harper, and Frida enter. The women sit in row of visitors' benches. Harper goes to John. Hello, Marvin. Hello, Mr. Harper. This wasn't necessary. Sheriff shows in Mrs. Preston and Mrs. Jordan. Walda. What? Look out for these ladies, will you? Why don't you do it? I'm busy. 
Walter looks at John and points to door. John and Walter laugh. Sheriff exits, closes door. Are you ladies parties to a case? Yes. This lady's divorce case comes up this morning, and I'm a witness. This way. He lets them through gate. Mrs. Jordan starts for second row, but seeing her companion going to first row, she follows. Margaret, Hammond, and Thomas enter from right first entrance. Margaret crosses left and shakes hands with Mrs. Jordan and sits in chair downstage in first row. Hammond crosses left and sits in chair upstage in back row. Thomas crosses to his chair back of table left center. Mrs. Cogshaw and Mrs. Starr come through gate and sit in back row of witness chairs. Perkins enters, carries a portfolio, and sits in chair upstage front row. Oh, there's Mr. Perkins now. Harper exits. A man and woman enter, sit in back row of visitor seats. Come along, Sheriff. Sheriff takes his place right of gate, raps with gavel. The judge, Lem, enters from judge's room and ascends to his place. All rise but one woman in witness chairs and one man on visitor's bench. Sheriff, to lady seated. Stand up, please. To man seated. Stand up. They do so. Open court, Sheriff. Teddy rises, comes to front row of visitor's bench, sits. Sheriff, raps with gavel. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. The Honorable District Court of Washoe County, Second Judicial District, is now open and in session. All persons having cause for action therein will give their attendance a calling to law. The people sit. Sheriff hurries to door up left and looks out. Lamb. Looking over papers. First case. Sheriff closes door and comes down to gate. Walter rises. Pacific Railroad versus John Marvin. Sits. Thomas, advancing. Plaintiff's ready. Crosses to judge. Sheriff starts to speak to judge. John, going center in front of table. Defendant ready. Huh? Sheriff wheels about. Walter snickers with hand over mouth. Emily smiles. Thomas gives him one glance, then ignores him. Sheriff comes through gate and sits. Two women enter and sit in back row of visitor's bench. How long do you think this case will take? Takes out watch. Probably all morning, your honor. Lem to John. You represent the defendant? I am the defendant, Your Honor, and I represent him, too. Oh, you are counsel for yourself. Yes, sir. If it please, Your Honor, this is an action for the wrongful taking down of timber. The defendant was a former owner of the property. Margaret clears her throat and bows to judge. He sees her, bows too, and smiles at her. Thomas turns and looks at Margaret, who has risen. She sits. Lem, who hasn't been listening. Eh? What's that? I have been saying, Your Honor, that... Oh, yes. Just a moment. To Walter. Let me see the list. Walter hands judge the list. It may be best to dispose of these short cases first. Looks about courtroom, hands back list. Mrs. Davis? She rises and comes center. Are you ready? Why, yes, I think so. Lem, to Thomas and John. I'll take this case at two o'clock, Mr. Thomas. John returns to seat. Mr. Perkins tells the ladies they may wait. Then he goes. Two men enter and join other men on back seat of visitors' benches. Hammond rises and says something to Thomas, who nods. Then Hammond goes out down right. Walter rises. Davis versus Davis. Sits. 
Margaret sits front of table, left center. Thomas crosses to judge. If it please, Your Honor, this case. This case is Davis versus Davis, Mr. Thomas. I'm quite aware of that, Your Honor. I'm counsel for Mrs. Davis. Reporter and sheriff look at each other. You are? Yes, in place of Mr. Brainerd. Lem, displeased, glancing from Thomas to Margaret. Oh. As I believe your honor is familiar with the complaint and has gone over the deposition submitted by the plaintiff, and as the defendant has entered no denial or appeared in court or been represented by counsel, I move that the plaintiff be granted an absolute separation from the defendant forthwith. Lem, after glancing from Thomas to Margaret. Motion denied. Margaret rises. Oh. Sheriff raps desk. Margaret turns and looks at him. But, Your Honor, I understood that Your Honor considered the evidence. I deny the motion. Does that mean I can't get my divorce? No, no, Mrs. Davis. It means that the motion of your counsel is unusual and that I have good and sufficient reasons for denying it. I should be glad to try the case if your honor considers that necessary. All right, go ahead. Uh, certainly, your honor. Mrs. Davis, will you take the stand? Margaret wanders down toward clerk's desk. No, there. He indicates witness chair up center. She, in half-frightened, puzzled way, goes there and sits. Stand up, please. Who, me? Yes. Hold up your right hand. She does so. He stands with his hand raised, waiting for her. You solemnly swear the evidence you give to be the truth? The whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Margaret, nodding her head. I do. Sits, lowers her hand. What is your full name? Margaret rises, raising her hand before speaking. Margaret Davis. Thomas, turning and seeing her still standing with hand up. Uh, you just sit down, please, Mrs. Davis. She sits. Mrs. Davis, where do you live? New York. Lem glances at her. She notices it and adds quickly, Oh, no, I don't. I live here, in Nevada, and I've lived here long enough to get a divorce. The judge... Looks up at judge, then front. His honor can tell you that. She looks at Thomas anxiously, as if afraid she had said something to hurt her cause. Just answer the questions, please, Mrs. Davis. Well, that's not so easy when you're sworn to tell the truth. Several smile. Margaret glances at Lem, but he takes no notice. Stenographer writes in shorthand all evidence. You are the wife of Gerald Davis. I was. I mean, yes, sir. When were you married to him? Seven years ago, October 5th. Where? Peoria. I didn't get it. Margaret, turning to stenographer, distinctly. Peoria. It's a place. You were living in Peoria. I should say not. Oh, your husband living there? No, we were playing there. We were partners, doing a dancing act. When did your husband first show signs of not loving you? Margaret, not trying to be funny, but remembers she is under oath. About a year before we were married. Thomas walks left, then back to her. Then why did you marry him? That's hard to explain. But you see, we were in Peoria, and we were partners, and... And it rained all week. Well, somehow it seemed a good idea at the time. But after you were married, he was cruel to you? Uh, yes, sir. What did he do that was cruel? A lot of things. Will you name one? He put his name on the bill in larger type than mine. 
And he fought with you, didn't he? Uh, yes, sir. Did he strike you? Well, he was a poor judge of distance. But his treatment was sufficient to cause you mental anguish. Yes, sir. And then he deserted you. Well, we parted. And after he deserted you? The witness has not testified that her husband deserted her. Why, it's just the same thing. We were playing in Chicago, and I went west, and he stayed there. Oh. Crosses to left, then back to her. That sounds as if you deserted him. Well, I didn't do anything of the sort. Hmm, so far, Mrs. Davis, your testimony has not brought out anything to substantiate your complaint. Margaret, indicating Thomas. That's because he told me to do nothing but answer his questions, and then he asked me all the wrong things. She bursts into tears. Your Hannah, I... Oh, I didn't mean to blame you. To Lem. He doesn't know anything about my case. Lem glances from one to the other, sternly. Then why is he appearing for you? Because my lawyer's sick. What's that? And I wanted to tell you about it, but Mr. Thomas said I couldn't see you. Oh, he did. Glares at Thomas. Yes, and he said he'd do everything for me and you'd give me a divorce without any trouble at all. When did he tell you all this? Glaring at Thomas. Just now, when I came into court. This is the only time I've seen him since you were at the hotel. Lem, much relieved. Then why didn't you say so? Margaret, more tears. How could I if he didn't ask me? She wipes her eyes with handkerchief. There, there. Don't let it upset you. Rises and offers her a glass of water. Margaret, looking up at him. Water? Yes. No, thanks. Your Honor, I was simply acting from a friendly standpoint. In the case, I thought... No matter what your motives were, Mr. Thomas... You presumed when you told the plaintiff what the court's ruling would be. Now, Mrs. Davis, why did you leave your husband in Chicago? Thomas Cross's left sits back of table left center. Because he didn't show up for a performance and I had to go on alone. And afterward, the manager told him the act was better without him than with him. And then he stayed away from the theater all the rest of the week... And on our next jump, he refused to go with me. And so you were obliged to go without him? Yes, I was under contract. Did you try to have him go with you? Of course I did. I mean, yes, Your Honor. But he said he'd show me how long I'd last on my own. And you showed him? Yes, Your Honor. And since that time, he has never contributed to your support? No, sir. I've contributed to his. Bursts into tears. Have you ever heard from him since? Only when he wrote for money. Have you ever seen him since? No, sir. In tears, broken up. But you've tried to see him, haven't you? Pause, then nods, suggesting that she say yes. Then she nods with him. Yes, Your Honor. I've got Mr. Blackmore's sworn statement to prove that. Lamb, looking over papers. Yes, it's here. Also, deposition dated Chicago, stating that Davis left you without warning and refused to dance with you again. Yes, Your Honor. Lamb, after a moment's examination of papers. Your decree is granted. Margaret, going to front of judge's desk. Oh, Your Honor. Bursts into tears and crosses to door right. There, there, Mrs. Davis, please. He rises. I'm so emotional, you know. Exit right first entrance. Lamb watches her exit. Mr. Sheriff, announce a temporary recess. He rises and exits right on platform. 
Sheriff, hitting table with gavel. Shout recess. Sheriff humors laugh. End of Act Two, Part One. Act Two, Part Two of Lightning by Winchell Smith and Frank Bacon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Part Two. Sheriff, after his line, short recess, goes over and leans on lower left arm of witness box, talking to Emily three quarters back to audience so he can see doors. Thomas goes out down right. Mrs. Moore and Mrs. Jordan and two men in the back row leave the room. An old man on the end seat of back row has to stand up to let others out. Bill enters from outside. He is in gar uniform, comes to railing, looking about timidly, starts to come through. The extra people cover Bill's entrance all they can. Two men off stage. Yeah, what do you want? Stops Bill at gate. Bill, after a look at Sheriff. Been arresting anybody in California lately? John, turning and rushing to him at sound of his voice. Why, hello, Lightning. How in the world did you get here? The train was late. Your case ain't over, is it? No, it's called for two o'clock. Bill, to Sheriff. I'm a witness for him. Oh, yar. I got to testify how you served a warrant on him. Comes through gate. Walter laughs and turns away. Sheriff glares. Threatens him with fist. Emily laughs. John, taking Bill down left. Come over here, Lightning. How in the world did you happen to show up? I promised you, didn't I? Right of John. During scene, Sheriff stands with back to audience, reading paper. Well, that was a long time ago. I supposed you'd forgotten all about it. I haven't forgotten nothing since I was four years old. How do you know the trial was today? You told me last time you was at the home. But you didn't say anything about coming. If you had, I'd have told you it wasn't necessary. That's why I didn't say nothing. How'd you get the money? Pension. You told me you sent the pension to your wife. I did some of it. I sent Mother six dollars, but I didn't get no answer. Did you tell her you were in the soldier's home? No. Then she probably didn't know where you were. Where else could I be? And six dollars is six dollars. The judge? Mrs. Moore and Mrs. Jordan re-enter. Lem comes from judge's room. Sheriff raps. All rise. Lem motions to Sheriff as he is sitting, at which time all except Bill sit and whispers to him to get Mrs. Davis. Sheriff nods and goes to door down right. Calls Mrs. Davis. Margaret enters. Sheriff gives her a seat front of judge's desk. Thomas enters, crosses toward his desk, pauses as he sees Bill, then crosses to end of table. Hammond follows and whispers to Thomas about Bill. He is Thomas. Hammond comes in behind him, both pause a moment in surprise at seeing Bill. Then Hammond goes up to left. Bill wanders forward, keeping his eyes on Thomas, and doesn't see Mrs. Jones, who now enters, till they are almost face to face. Why, Mother, what are you doing here? Millie enters. Oh, Daddy. Sheriff raps. Margaret helps Mrs. Jones to seat by her. Thomas sits. Come along, Mr. Clark. I want to get through promptly at noon today. Glances at Margaret. I've got an important engagement. He smiles at Margaret, and she turns and smiles at him. Call the next case. Jones versus Jones. Rises and then sits. John, going to Bill. By Jove, I believe that's you, Bill. Me? Did you know your wife was... Sheriff raps. 
Bill turns and looks at him. Read the complaint. Walter rises, reads. To the people of the state of Nevada, Mary Jones, plaintiff versus William Jones, defendant, a civil action wherein the said plaintiff deposes and says she was lawfully married to the said defendant on the 14th day of June, 1896, in the state of Nevada. The said plaintiff prays this court for a permanent annulment of her marriage vows, the defendant William Jones, having disregarded and broken all obligations of the marriage contract, thereby causing the plaintiff's great suffering and mental agony and the said mary jones claims a final separation and divorce from the said william jones on the grounds of failure to provide habitual intoxication and intolerable cruelty subscribed and sworn to me on the fifth day of april nineteen hundred and seventeen alexander bradshaw notary raymond thomas attorney for the plaintiff Walter sits. Bill goes to John. Is that all about me? Sheriff raps. Bill looks at him. Lem, looking at Bill. What did you say? John crosses to Judge. Your Honor, this is Mr. Jones, the defendant. He happens to be in court as a witness in another case and has had no previous knowledge whatever of this action. The defendant's whereabouts are unknown, Your Honor, and the court allowed us to serve notice by publication. Publication in what? Turns to Thomas. Lem looks at John. Proper service was given if the defendant couldn't be located. To Bill. Is that what you asked about? Bill turns to Judge, pauses. Who, me? Yes, you made some remark after the complaint was read. I wasn't sure I'd got it straight. You mean the grounds on which this action is based? I guess so. Lamb to Walter. Repeat that part of the complaint. Walter, rising, finding place. The grounds are failure to provide habitual intoxication and intolerable cruelty walter sits is that all don't you think it's enough sounded as if there was more the first time he read it the defendant enters a general denial your honor are you counsel for the defense bill before john can speak yes sir he's my lawyer Call your witnesses, Mr. Thomas. John sits, Bill Center. Mrs. Jones. Hammond, anticipating this, comes to Thomas and whispers, then goes back to seat. I don't think it will be necessary for you to testify after all, Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones returns to her seat. Miss Berkeley, will you take the stand, please? Millie rises, surprised, looks about and goes towards stand. Bill smiles at her. She stands in front of witness chair, then goes up on stand. John sits left of table. Bill is seated in front of it. Raise your right hand. He and Millie raise hands. You solemnly swear the evidence you give to be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. She sits. What is your full name? Mildred Buckley. Thomas crosses to the stand. Miss Buckley, you make your home with Mrs. Jones, the plaintiff, do you not? Yes, sir. How long have you lived with her? Since I was three years old. You were an orphan, and Mrs. Jones took you into her home and brought you up as though you were her own daughter. Isn't that so? Yes, sir. And ever since you can remember, Mrs. Jones has toiled and slaved early and late to provide for the family. Millie, looking at Mrs. Jones. Yes, sir. About three years ago, you left home, did you not? That is, Mrs. Jones's home. 
Yes, sir. Why did you leave? To try and earn my living. And you obtained employment as a stenographer? Yes, sir. What did you do with your wages? Why, I, I... Thomas, leaning on witness stand. I'm sorry to be obliged to ask these questions, Miss Berkeley, because I know how you dread to testify in this case. But it's unavoidable. You sent the greatest part of your wages home, did you not? Millie, looks front, drops head. Yes, sir. And you felt obliged to leave home and earn money in order to contribute to the support of the Jones family. Why, yes, but I... Did you ever see Mrs. Jones' husband drunk? Looks at Bill. Under the influence of liquor. Pause. Answer the question, please. Looks at Millie. Did you ever see Mr. Jones intoxicated? Millie drops head. Yes, sir. You've seen him in that condition hundreds of times, haven't you? Why, I... I never counted. Drops head. But he was in the habit of coming home drunk, wasn't he? Looks at Millie. Sometimes. And because of the poverty brought about by Jones's bad habits, you were obliged to leave home. What? No, I... Well, you knew something had to be done, and you felt it was your duty to help them. Yes, sir. Drops head. Thank you, Miss Berkeley. That's all. Sits at table. Millie half rises to leave stand. John, coming to her left. Miss Berkeley. Millie stands still, surprised. When you took a position as a stenographer, by whom were you employed? After a pause, Millie walks toward her seat right. One moment, miss. She stops angry and frightened. The counsel for the defense has asked you a question. Ah, uh, I refuse to answer it. Lem, after a surprised pause. What is your reason for refusing? Millie turns to him. Must I tell the reason? Yes, you must. Because I swore I would never speak to the man who asked it. Lem. Looks from John to Millie. Oh, well, this is embarrassing. Pause. Will you answer if I ask the question? Certainly, sir. Smiles. Lem motions her back to stand. She goes back to witness box. Who employed you as stenographer? Mr. Thomas. All through following scene, she looks at Judge, her back to John. This, Mr. Thomas, the gentleman whose questions you did answer. The plaintiff's counsel. Yes, sir. And did Mr. Thomas give you this position because you told him you wanted to be of financial assistance to the Jones family? Thomas rises. Your Honor, I object to that question. It is quite irrelevant. John, to judge, facing him. I am quite willing to withdraw it if Mr. Thomas, turns to Thomas, finds it objectionable. Millie looks front. Don't flatter yourself that I mind it or anything else you can ask. Only it has no bearing on this case. Facing each other. Objection sustained. Well, Miss Buckley, Mr. Thomas has taken an interest in your affairs and given you advice. He... To John, then turns to Judge. She stops, angry that she forgot herself. Turns away. The question was, has Mr. Thomas taken an interest in your affairs and given you advice? Mr. Thomas has been more than kind to me always. He is kind to everybody, and he has given me advice that has been of the greatest help. And have you always followed his advice? Have you... Always, implicitly, in spite of what others have said against it. Now, Miss Buckley, 
You never knew Mr. Jones to be cruel or even unkind to his wife, did you? I object. Rises. Cruelty is one of the counts in your complaint. Objection overruled. To Emily. What was the question? Emily, reading notes. Now, Miss Buckley, you never knew Mr. Jones to be cruel or even unkind to his wife, did you? No, sir, never. You never saw him unkind to anyone or anything, did you? Did you? No, sir, I never did. The complaint which was read claims a divorce on the ground of drunkenness, failure to provide, and cruelty. You know that none of these is the real object for getting the divorce, don't you, Miss Buckley? I object. Rises. Lem, pause. Objection sustained. To John. If the plaintiff can prove any one of the three counts enumerated in the complaint, it will be sufficient cause to grant a divorce, no matter what other reasons or objects there are. Miss Buckley, you know that Mr. Jones loved his wife, loved her devotedly, don't you? How can she know that? If it please, Your Honor, that is something that a woman does know. She may believe a man to be a contemptible liar. She may say she'll hate and despise him always, always, always. But somehow, down in her heart, if he really loves her, she knows it. And if she is his ideal, his hope, his all, if he would willingly, gladly lay down his life for her, she can't help knowing it. And no matter what she says about him or thinks about him, the knowledge that he cares more for her than for all else in the entire universe must count for something. And I contend, Your Honor. Millie turns and weeps. Hold on there. Wait a minute. Are you trying a divorce case or making love? I beg your pardon, Your Honor. That's all, Miss Buckley. Turns to chair left of table. And I should say it's quite enough. Now suppose we get back to business. Thomas rises. That will do, Miss Buckley. Millie goes to seat. Mr. Hammond. Hammond rises promptly, goes to witness stand, and raises right hand. Mrs. Moore enters, looks around, then comes through gate and comes to Mrs. Preston, takes her chair, and Mrs. Preston takes Hammond's chair. Walter rises. You solemnly swear the evidence you give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God? I do. Sits. What is your full name? Everett Hammond. Crosses right leg. Mr. Hammond, what is your place of residence? Crosses to left of stand. San Francisco. You are in the real estate business, are you not? I am, yes, sir. You know the plaintiff, Mrs. Jones, and her husband, the defendant. I do. Looks at Mrs. Jones, and then at Bill. How long have you known them? I met them first about uh, seven months ago. Kindly tell the court how you happened to meet them. Hammond to judge. I was asked to consider the purchase of a piece of property belonging to Mrs. Jones. And you went to see it? I had some other business nearby and stopped off at the Jones's place. What was the other business? The Pacific Railroad was being robbed of timber in that locality and sent me with a sheriff to arrest the thief. Sheriff looks at Hammond. Who was the sheriff? Sheriff looks at Thomas. Mr. Blodgett, the sheriff of this court. Nods toward sheriff. And who was the thief? His name is John Marvin. Doesn't look at John. The same, uh, gentleman who has been playing Romeo? Yes, sir, the same gentleman. Since that time, you have had business dealings with Mrs. Jones. I have. Looks at her. And you have always found her to be upright and honest. Absolutely. 
and was Mr. Jones a source of trouble and great embarrassment to Mrs. Jones? Yes, sir. He was. Looks at Bill. In what way? By his shiftlessness, drunkenness, cruelty, and untruthfulness. So he was untruthful into the bargain. He has a local reputation for being the biggest liar in the county. Bill rises, starts to take off his coat. John persuades him not to. Sheriff rises with the gavel and sits after Bill sits. Did you ever see Mr. Jones drunk? Yes, sir. I never saw him in any other way. And you saw him abuse his wife? Yes, sir. You heard him tell lies? I did, indeed. He was also breaking the law by harboring a fugitive from justice in his house. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. That's all. John, coming to Hammond on left of stand. You say, Mr. Hammond, that you had business dealings with Mrs. Jones? Yes. Crosses leg, turns away from John. Do you mind telling what that business was? Not at all. To judge. I purchased for the Golden Gate Land Company 329 acres of land, including buildings. By buildings, you mean the hotel? I mean the property and everything on it. Sneering. And you bought the property from Mrs. Jones? I did. Why didn't you consult Mr. Jones? Because Mrs. Jones was the sole owner. You had seen the records? Yes, I'd seen the records. Now, you testified that you first met Mr. and Mrs. Jones about seven months ago. I did. Do you remember the date? I don't recall the exact date. Pauses. Looks at him. Perhaps you can. It was the day I brought his sheriff there with a warrant for your arrest. Possibly the sheriff will remember the date. Sheriff looks at Hammond, then starts toward John and Chair. Possibly. And you had not met Mr. and Mrs. Jones before? No, I had not. And you also met Mr. Thomas on that same day? Yes, he represented Mrs. Jones. And Miss Buckley was there, too? Yes, they were all there. John, facing front. And you had never met Miss Buckley or Mr. Thomas before? Hammond, pause. No, I don't think so. Well. Pause. At least are you sure you had not met them before, to your knowledge? Yes, I am sure of that. All right. Comes down, goes up. Mr. Hammond, you have told the court that Mr. Jones was a lawbreaker. Yes. You were a fugitive from justice and Jones was harboring you in his house. Didn't you just testify that Mrs. Jones was the sole owner of that house? Pause. Didn't you? Hammond, pause. Yes, and my testimony was correct. Then how could Mr. Jones harbor a fugitive in his house if he didn't have a house? Well, I don't suppose he could. Then will you withdraw the statement that he broke the law? It's a technical point. Will you withdraw it? Yes, I withdraw it. Bill is pleased, proud of John. Now, up to the time you met Mr. Jones, you didn't know anything about him, did you? Of course not. But it didn't take me long to find out about him. I agree with you there, Mr. Hammond. Eight hours after you first saw Mr. Jones, he was driven out of the house, and you have never set eyes on him since. Yet you have testified that he is a drunkard, a loafer, a liar, and a lawbreaker. Hammond, pause. It didn't take me one hour to see what Jones was. You also said he was cruel to his wife. He was. In what way? Hammond, pause. His manner was insulting. What did he do that was insulting? Hammond, pause. He criticized the dress she was wearing. Pause. Uh, before the other guests. And do you think the claim of intolerable cruelty is substantiated by a husband criticizing his wife's dress? I object to that question. Rises. 
I should think you would. Goes downstage and turns. Objection sustained. John comes upstage and to left of stand. You testified that Mr. Jones was a drunkard, that you'd never seen him sober. I never have. John, taking Bill by the arm, Bill stands back to audience on John's left. Is he drunk now? I don't know. John goes back to stand. Bill sits. Then how did you know the other time you saw him? It was plain enough then. Now, you couldn't get a good title to the Jones property unless Mr. Jones signed the deed, could you? Thomas rises. I object to that question. That matter is quite irrelevant. If it please, Your Honor, this complaint charges intoxication. My question has a direct bearing on that point. Objection overruled. Thomas sits. Hammond to Lem. I don't mind answering in the least. Lem to Emily. Read the question. Now, you couldn't get a good title to the property unless Mr. Jones signed the deed, could you? Hammond to Lem. The property belonged entirely to Mrs. Jones, but the husband's signature was wanted on the deed. And he refused to sign it? Yes, after you told him not to. Was he drunk, then? Hammond, pause. I think he was. I'm not asking you what you think. You have said under oath that you never saw him sober. Was he drunk when he refused to sign that deed? Yes, he was. And you tried to induce him to sign such an important document as that when he was drunk? Hammond, pause. I never tried to get him to sign. Then Mr. Thomas did. Well, I didn't, and he didn't sign it. No, he wasn't drunk enough for that. He wasn't drunk at all. He was as sober as he is at this moment, and you know it. You mean to call me a liar? Leans forward. No, I mean to prove it. Goes down stage center, comes up again. Now, you called Mr. Jones a liar. Yes, and everybody who knows him will say the same thing. Did you testify he was a liar because you heard others say so? No, because he lied to me. What did he tell you that was untrue? Everything he told me was untrue. Repeat one lie that he told you, can you? He told me so many I can't recall them. They couldn't have amounted to much if you can't remember one. Hammond, pause. He said he drove a swarm of bees across the plains in dead winter. Bill, facing front, tries to keep a straight face, but finally burst out laughing. Well, how do you know that's a lie? Of course it's a lie. Can you prove it? Oh, I know the thing's impossible. How? Have you ever tried it? That's all nonsense. That's precisely what it is, Mr. Hammond. Nonsense. And that's just what Mr. Jones meant it to be. Pause. What else did he say? What's the difference? You say it's all nonsense. Not all, Mr. Hammond. He said at least one thing that wasn't nonsense. He said to his wife, Mother, these two men are trying to rob you. Do you remember that? You were all there. Do you remember his saying you and Mr. Thomas were trying to rob Mrs. Jones? Points to each. Hammond rises. Sheriff rises. I don't propose to sit here and be insulted by a criminal like you. This is insufferable, Your Honor, that a gentleman coming here to give disinterested testimony as a favor. I think the defense has brought out quite clearly that this witness's testimony is not disinterested. This divorce has got to be obtained to give him a good deed to the Joneses' property, hasn't it? Mr. Hammond didn't testify on that account. Perhaps not, but I wouldn't call him exactly disinterested. Nevertheless, Your Honor, I protest against this man's insulting manner. 
how it is possible for such a person, a person who even now should be serving a jail sentence to be admitted to the bar I can't conceive. Turns away, sits, slams books. Lem, to John. You are an attorney in good standing, are you not? Thomas turns back quickly. John goes down stage, pauses. No, Your Honor. What? Do you mean to tell me you've never been admitted to the bar? John crosses to Lem. No, I haven't, Your Honor, but this defendant has just taken a long journey to help me. He came today from the soldier's home of his own accord, and at his own expense, to testify in my case. And when, without warning, this action against him for divorce was called, I knew it was conspiracy, that these two conspirators... Crosses to left of stand, comes center. Hammond rises. Thomas, jumping up. Your Honor! Sheriff raps. Sit down, Mr. Thomas. Thomas sits. I'll attend to this. You are making a very serious charge, Mr. Marvin, and if you believe that you can substantiate it, you will have due recourse to the courts. In the meantime, you must be aware that you had no right whatsoever to undertake the trial of this case under the guise of being an attorney. You are guilty of a reprehensible act. To Emily. The stenographer will strike from the record all the evidence in this case that has been brought out by your cross-examination. Hammond sits. Mr. Thomas, have you finished with your witness? Thomas rises. If the cross-examination is to be thrown out, I will not take up the court's time by redirect testimony. John, as Hammond starts from seat. One moment, if it please your honor, before the witness is excused. You have no standing in this court. If you wish to remain, you will take a seat on the visitor's bench. John turns slowly, thinking hard. This way. As John reaches gate, Sheriff opens it. John, rushing quickly left and in front of table, puts arm around Bill. But, Your Honor, the defendant has a legal right to plead his own case. Yes, he has. John helping Bill to his feet. Then, if it please your honor, he will take up the examination. Lem to Bill. You have the right to do that if you care to. John crosses to center, going up toward Judge. He does, your honor. Sheriff to John. You come out here. I'm a witness for the defense, your honor. Lem pointing to witness chair down left. Then sit there. Sheriff sits after applause. John goes to front row, down stage. Bill looks confused. Lem to Bill. Examine your witness. What's the matter with him? During the laugh, John sneaks to chair left of table. The things John asked him was all right. To Hammond. And to them. You mean the testimony he has already given? John sneaks in chair in front of table. I got a right to ask him over again, ain't I? John moves to end of table. Yes. John steals up and takes Bill's seat. Do I have to go all over that, Your Honor? Would your replies be the same? Hammond. After a moment's hesitation. Certainly. Lem to Emily. Reinstate the cross-examination. Questions put by the defendant. Bill smiles at John. Hammond, about to get up. Is that all? Bill looks at John, who shakes his head violently. Bill, repeating gesture. No, no. Hold on. I got some more for you. 
John whispers to him. Yeah, I was going to. Going to Hammond with legal pose. Ah, uh, Mr. Hammond, uh, you uh, wait a moment. Goes back to John, where John can whisper questions to him. When you went after Mr. Marvin with a sheriff, what was the charge against him? Trespassing on the property of the Pacific Railroad Company. Uh-huh. Crosses back to John. If he was on their property. To John. What's that? Has to bend down to John to get rest of sentence. What did you have to do with it? I went at the request of the president of the road. You sold the railroad, the land he was trespassing on, didn't you? Thomas, jumping up. I object to that question. Mr. Thomas, you and your witness have been accused of conspiracy. If I were you, I'd allow the witness to answer that question. Bill, back to John. Your Honor, I don't propose to defend the witness and myself from such a ridiculous charge at this time. We are not on trial. This is a divorce action. Objection overruled. If there is any conspiracy about this action, the court wants to know it. Answer the question. I purchased the property for the railroad acting as their agent. Who did you buy it from? Who did you buy it from? Mr. Thomas. When did you buy it? When did you buy it? About ten months ago. Bill, by himself. That's three months before you bought Mother's place. Yes. Bill, going up to him by himself. Then why did you swear you'd never met him till you saw him at the hotel? Because I never did. You bought all that land of him and never saw him about it? To Lem, crossing to him. And he called me a liar. As Hammond moves. Don't go away. We got some more for you. To John. Ain't we? I got one for him. You know, the railroad company leased the waterfall on Mother's Place and put up a power plant there? I believe they have. And you know that the railroad pays you more for that lease in a month than you agreed to give Mother in a year? I don't know anything about that. The railroad leases with the Golden Gate Land Company. Who controls the Golden Gate Land Company? I don't know. Don't you know? It's controlled by you and Mr. Thomas. Your Honor, I object. And that all your stocks in the name of rummies. John stops him. Dummies. Dummies. Uh, dummies. Dummies. Thomas rises. I protest against this. Hammond rises. Sit down, Mr. Thomas. You're beginning to make me believe in this fraud story. Then let him go on talking. Judge Townsend, I refuse to submit to this any longer, to stand here and be made to look like a criminal. Well, you look natural. Do you expect me to stand for this? You can sit down if you want to. I'm all through with you. Goes to John. Thomas, crosses left of stand. All this absurd testimony has no possible connection with the case in part, but I propose to prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that the insinuations against the integrity of the witness and myself are not only groundless but positively malicious, and I shall do this at the first opportunity. Sits. John, to Lem. Your Honor, Mr. Thomas will have that opportunity at two o'clock this afternoon when the Pacific Railroad's action against me comes before this court. 
At that time, I will submit positive documentary proof that these men control the Golden Gate Company, and that company has been buying up all the property wanted by the Pacific Railroad. I will submit to the court 20 cases where the Golden Gate Company has swindled innocent victims out of property and paid them for it with worthless stock. I will prove to the court. Just a moment, Mr. Marvin. It will be most interesting for you to prove your statements at two o'clock. I must remind you again, however, that you are not a party to this divorce action and have no standing in this court. Yes, Your Honor. If the defendant wishes you for a witness, you may be sworn. I don't want no witnesses for the divorce. Bill crosses to center. John goes up to rail, right of sheriff. I didn't know anything about it till I got here. But I've been thinking it over ever since, and I've made up my mind, Mother's right. If Mother can prove them things he read, she can get a divorce, can't she? Yes. Well, I can prove them for her. You can prove them? Oh, yes. I used to be a judge. Now, first, it said I got drunk. Well, I can prove that. And it, uh, then it said, I was cruel to mother. Well, I can, uh, no, I can't prove that one because it ain't true, judge. And I don't believe mother ever said it. But then it said, I failed to provide. That's the one that's on my mind. I have failed, judge. I never thought anything about it before, but I don't see no chance to provide now that I do think of it. Mother and Millie can get along better without me. So you can see Mother ought to have a divorce, Judge, and I'm all right. I can go back to the home and stay there until, uh, until, um, that's all, Judge. Turns left. He goes towards seat. Mrs. Jones. Going before judge's desk. No, judge. Please don't give me a divorce if you can help it. Please, judge. I don't want it. I didn't know what I was doing. They said it was the only way I could take care of Bill and myself in our old age. But they was just telling me lies. Goes to Bill. Turns. Bill, I've done you wrong, and I can't blame you if you never look at me again. But I didn't mean to, Bill. Didn't mean to, and if you'll forgive me and take me back, I'll try all my life to make up for it. Will you? Will you, Bill? She holds out her arms to him. Bill turns to Mrs. Jones. Did you ever get six dollars I sent you? Mrs. Jones crosses toward John. Millie crosses to Bill. This complaint is dismissed. Call the next case. Preston versus Preston. Mrs. Preston crosses to stand. John comes to Bill down center. Perkins crosses to judge and hands up paper. Second curtain. Clerk. To Mrs. Preston. Raise your right hand. She does so. You solemnly swear the evidence you give shall be the truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Curtain. End of Act Two, Part Two. Act Three of Lightning by Winchell Smith and Frank Bacon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene. Same as Act One, except that there is a small table center with chairs right and left of it. Small cigar case with cigars on California desk. Electric fixtures have taken the place of those used previously. In the distance, waterfall is seen, with power plant building near it. This spot is lighted with a number of electric lights, making small blaze of light. Discovered. At rise, Fred Peters, the Golden Gate Hotel company manager, is behind Nevada desk, shooting dice with a liveryman opposite. As the curtain rises, the liver man throws. Four threes. Peters. 
gathers up dice, shakes them, throws, leaves three dice, picks up two. All I need is another six. Throws again. It ain't there. Picks up the two dice, returns them to Shaker, throws again. Liverman, sweeping off coins from desk. I thought four threes would be enough. I can't throw a shadow tonight. Zeb enters center. Peter sees Zeb. Now, what do you want? I just dropped in. Now, do you like to drop out? You know I don't allow no loafing in this office. Who's a loafing? I want a cigar. Then show me your nickel. Oh, uh, I, I, I got it. Finds coin and gives it to Peters. Peters, taking nickel. Go over and get one. You know the box. Crosses to Nevada desk. Puts money in drawer under desk. And don't take but one. I got my eye on you. One's all I want. Peters, behind desk, counting change. And don't take a good one. Zeb, looking at him. Eh, uh, what? Peters, fixing keys in letter rack. I mean a ten-cent one. Oh, uh, I like the fives better than the tens. You never had a ten. Uh, well, that's why I like the fives better. Liveryman and clerk look at Zeb. He has taken cigar and comes back. Say, nobody ain't seen lightning, has they? Light cigar crosses to center. Liveryman crosses down right to Zeb front of table. So that's what you're doing over here, is it? I heard his old woman and Millie come back this afternoon. Peters turns to Zeb and Liveryman. And they got put in their place, too. What do you mean? I mean, I'm manager here now. And the old woman can't put anything over on me just because she used to own the hotel. Goes up center above table. Did they say where Lightning was? Peters, at desk. No. Say, Zeb, Bill wouldn't be with her. Don't you know there's talk of their being divorced? Ah, I don't pay no attention to talk. But if Lightning should come back, uh, I'd like to see him. Peters comes from behind Zeb, sniffing at cigar. Puts him out. Hey, go on now, and smoke that damn thing outside. Peters goes behind desk left. Liverman goes to desk left. That's right. Take all a man's money, and then throw him out. Enter Lem and Margaret. Lem carries bags and flowers. Margaret wears auto veil, opens door for him. Zeb exits center after Lem enters. Lem sees Liveryman, recognizes him. Oh, Liveryman? Yes, sir. Will you look after my team? Yes, sir. Starts up center. And there's a basket under the sea I wish you'd bring in. Right away. Exits center. Lem goes to California desk, puts hat on cigar case, comes down center. Margaret crosses to desk left. Hello, Mrs. Davis. Good evening. Will you give me my key, Mr. Peters? Sure. Giving her the key. I didn't expect you back tonight. Well, I wasn't expecting it myself. Did your case come out all right? Lem and Margaret look at each other and smile. Wonderfully. Indicating Lem. This is Judge Townsend, Mr. Peters. Peters crosses to Judge. Mr. Peters is the manager of the hotel. Peters, posing with his own importance. The pleasure's all mine, Judge. Lem, looking at Peters. That's right. See here, have you got a sweet? Margaret turns quickly. Got a what? Have you got a... Margaret, breaking in on Judge. Oh, Mr. Peters, we'd like to see Miss Buckley and Mrs. Jones. All right. I'll go up and tell them you're here. Starts up Nevada stairs. Thank you. But, young man, I want to get a... 
Wait till he comes down, Judge. Yes, I can't do but one thing at a time. He exits. Margaret comes down to Judge, left of him. What's the matter, dear? Didn't you want the clerk to know we were married? Well, he's got to know it, I suppose. But I hated to have you tell him so right before me. You're not ashamed of it, are you? No, I'm proud of it. But it is embarrassing to leave here this morning to get rid of number one and come back this evening with number two. Judge turns away a little from her. She notices this. You're not angry, are you, dear? Taking his arm. Well, it's a little jarring to be referred to as number two. No, I didn't mean that, Lemuel. But I couldn't bear to have everyone staring and smirking at us. But this ain't a secret marriage, Maggie. Oh, I don't mind them knowing about it tomorrow, after we're gone. But let's be sure they don't find out tonight. All right, dear. Just as you say. He starts to embrace her as Peters comes down Nevada stairs. Mrs. Jones will be down in a few minutes. Sees Margaret and Judge embracing. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Judge Townsend is my husband, Mr. Peters. What? We were married this afternoon. You don't say so. Crosses to Lem. Quick work, eh, Judge? Lem glares at Peters and turns away. But we don't want you to say a word about it to anybody. Oh, I can keep a secret. My congratulations. And I hope this one turns out better than the other one did. Oh, Starts up Nevada stairs. Liverman brings in basket center. If you don't mind, we won't discuss that, Mr. Peters. Peters goes up right to basket. I'll go upstairs and take off my wraps. Going upstairs left. Tell Mrs. Jones I'll be down in five minutes. At top of stairs, she blows kiss to Lem. Exits. Judge blows kiss back to Margaret. Peters breaking in on this. Do you want anything done with that basket, Judge? Yes, I want to arrange a little special supper. What, tonight? Comes down center. You don't suppose I want it tomorrow morning, do you? But everybody's gone to bed. Lem, taking a bill out of his pocket. Well, do you think that would get the cook up? That would get the whole hotel up. Lem takes another bill and offers it to Peters. And would that make you willing to help a little and not be so damn fresh? Peters, after hesitation, taking money. Why, I, uh, well, thank you, Judge. Crosses back to California desk. Now I've got everything there. Indicating basket upright. Tell the cook to fix up the crab meat salad. She ain't no good on crab meat. She can put it on a platter, can't she? <laughs> yes, she can do that. Lem, registering. And make some coffee. She makes rotten coffee. Well, then put the champagne on ice. We ain't got a bit of ice left. Oh, Lord. Turns away, then back to Peter's. What's the best room you got? Peters, looking at register, then at key rack. I can give you number two. Number two? My God, I don't want number two. Looking upstairs after Margaret. Well, here's five. What sort of a room is that? Nothing to be proud of. Well, let's see it. Peters comes back of desk to table center. Takes grips, starts upstairs with them. I'll show you right up. This way, Judge. And, Peters, can you get me a vase for these flowers? Unwraps parcel and takes out bunch of flowers. No, sir, but I can get you a water pitcher. Exits upstairs right. Waited thirty years for a honeymoon, then come to a damn joint like this. Follows Peters off upstairs right. Mrs. Jones enters from Nevada side as Mr. and Mrs. Harper enter from center. Harper first, then Mrs. Harper, and closes door. 
Mrs. Harper comes down right of table. Mr. Harper left of table. Ah, the place is deserted. Ah, oh, Mrs. Jones, don't you remember us? Why, it's Mr. and Mrs. Harper. Comes down left. We just brought Mr. Marvin and your husband over from Reno. Oh, where are they? John went over to see the probate judge, and Bill's out there telling a friend about being a lawyer. <laughs> Margaret enters from Nevada stairs. Hello. Why, good evening, How Mrs. Davis. How do you Davis. do? Good evening. How did you get back tonight? Why, my... Judge Townsend drove me over. Wasn't that romantic? What do you know about it? Only that the judge seemed to be so taken with you in court. Lem enters down California stairs. Peters follows him down, takes basket and exits into kitchen during following. Oh, Judge Townsend, this is Mr. and Mrs. Harper. Lem, bowing to each in turn. How do you do, Mrs. Harper? How do you do? How are you, Judge? Lem, to Mrs. Jones at left. I am very glad to see you under more pleasant circumstances, Mrs. Jones. Thank you, sir. Can you tell me what happened in Mr. Marvin's case this afternoon? Oh, don't you know about that? Crosses to Judge. They had to do everything Marvin demanded. They were lucky to keep out of jail. They gave up this place without a murmur. What? Why, didn't you know the place was yours again? Ours again? Why, yes. Yes. Crosses to her. And you get all the money the company pays for the waterfall. It's an awful lot. How much is it, dear? To Lamb. Mrs. Jones looks at Margaret. She stops suddenly, puts hand over her mouth. Why, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> I called you dear. To Mrs. Jones. I called him dear. To others. Well, you see, he's my husband. What? Your husband? You don't say. She doesn't want anybody to know about it. We were married this afternoon. Mrs. Harper kisses Margaret. What a surprise. Mrs. Jones crosses and kisses her. Well, of all things. Then Harper kisses her and turns her into Peter's arms, who enters from dining room during the above. He also kisses her, goes down extreme right. Harper crosses behind Mrs. Harper, Margaret's head on Mrs. Harper's shoulder. Will you return her when you're through with her? Excuse me, can I speak to you, Judge? What is it? Crosses to Peters. I found a piece of ice, and I've got the champagne on the table. Lem turns to the others. Margaret comes down between Lem and Peters. Mrs. Davis and I... Lemuel! I mean, my wife and I are going to have a little special supper. Won't y'all do us the honor of... Oh, yes, do. That would be lovely. Well, that's fine. Splendid! We'd be delighted. Peters starts up California stairs. Now, I'll get the cook up. Oh, Judge, let me do the cooking, won't you? Crosses to Lem. Peters stops. Oh, no. Mrs. Jones, turning to Margaret. I'm just dying to get back in that kitchen again. Well, if you want to do it, it would be a crime to stop you. I know what your cooking is like. Thank you, Judge. Goes up and exits into kitchen. And can't we set the table? You can do anything you like, ladies. Come along, Judge. We'll all set the table. Crosses right, opens door. Come along. It'll be great fun. The four exit into dining room, chatting. Peters, as they go through dining room door. Am I invited, Judge? Lem turns at door. Certainly. You're invited to wait on table. Lem exits. All right, I'll do that. Exits into kitchen. Bill enters center, comes down looking about, followed by Zeb. <coughs> oh, go on, Bill. Then what happened? And after that, 
The judge never decided nothing till he looked at me. Leaning against Nevada counter. Why, they was getting all the best of it till I went after them. Come on, Zeb, what are you afraid of? I hate to tell you, Bill, oh, but I reckon you've got to know. Your wife's here. I know it. Oh, you, you do? Yes. It seems curious her coming here now. You're divorced. We ain't divorced. You ain't divorced? No. I thought you said you won the case. Didn't you say you won it? Bill looks at Zeb. Pauses. Question overruled. Turns left. Peters enters kitchen door. Crosses to California desk. Discovers Zeb. Peters to Zeb. You're back again, are you? I object to that question. That fellow's the manager. No, he ain't. What's the reason I ain't? Crosses to Bill. Cause you're fired. That's what Mrs. Jones just said, but I take my orders from Mr. Hammond. Oh, you do? Well, here they are. Hands Peter's letter. Peter's opening letter. Well, if I am fired, I can go back to my old job. What's that? I'm a bartender. Bill comes down looking at Peter's. A good one? Yes, a good one. Well, I'll fix it so you can stay here. I guess I'd better talk to Mrs. Jones about that. Exits into kitchen. Millie enters from Nevada stairs. Zeb sees Millie. Look out! Starts for door. Hold on, Zeb. What are you afraid of? It's only Millie. Well, I'll see you tomorrow when the women folks is working. It's uh, safer then. Exits center right. Did you just get here, Daddy? Yes. Crosses center and leans on chair. Have you seen Mother? Crosses to Bill. That's all right. I ain't had a drink in a month. Did you come alone? Huh? Oh, why didn't you speak to John before you left the court? Millie, trying to hold back the tears. Ah, I, I couldn't. Well, it's all right. I fixed it for you. What? I got him to promise he'd come over here and see you. You asked him to come over and see me? Crosses to him. No, I told him you was just crazy to see him. Oh, Daddy. You'd have lost him if it hadn't been for me. Why, every girl in Reno is after John, but I got him so he's willing to marry you. Millie turns to Bill, horror-stricken. You asked him to marry me? Yes, and it was a tough job after the way you treated him. What did he say? I told him you'd make a fool of yourself, but all women do that now and then. And if you'd own up that you was ashamed, like Mother did, he'd better give you another chance. Oh! Now, if you'll beg his pardon when he comes... I won't see him when he comes. Starts towards stairs. Bill, putting hand in his pocket, crosses above table. If you don't see him, what's he gonna do with this? Pulls out ring in a box and shows it to her. What is it? Crosses to him. Yeah, it's a ring he got for you. He sent me out to buy it while he was in court. Oh! Turns and runs into kitchen. Bill looks after Millie a moment, turns back and puts ring in pocket. Bill looks at register desk, raises lid looking for bottle, closes it slowly, hand on counter, looks at hand, wipes hand on coat. Just, just. Never like that when I was here. Sees electric button behind counter. What's that? Pushes button number one. Bracket left above door goes out. Well. Pushes button number two. Brackets right and left go out. That's funny. Pushes button number three. Everything goes out. Now I broke it. Mrs. Jones enters. 
When Mrs. Jones is on, Bill presses button. Everything comes on. Now I fixed it. Comes from behind counter. Turns back to Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones slowly comes down to him. Are you all right, Bill? He breathes into her face. I didn't mean that. Ain't you all tired out? No. Mrs. Jones, placing chair for him left center. Sit down and rest yourself. She seats him, places pillow behind him. He turns and watches her, then settles back. Bill, after he is fixed in chair. What's the matter, mother? You sick? No, Bill. Bill looks curiously about the room, notices electric fixtures, while Mrs. Jones takes chair from in front of table center and, placing it on Bill's right, sits down and takes his hand. He pulls it away. Mrs. Jones holds on to it. You have forgiven me, ain't you, Bill? Yes. Bill. Oh? Just think. Just think of the place being ours again. It's yours again. No, ours after this, Bill. All right. Mrs. Jones lets go of his hand. How did Mr. Marvin manage to get it away from them? I saw to it. Did anybody tell you how much money you get out of the waterfall? Mrs. Jones, looking front and back at Bill. Yes, but please say we get it. You mean I get half of it? Yes. Ah, oh, and you're going to keep it for me. Mrs. Jones smiles at Bill. How'd you know about my getting the place back? Judge Townsend told me. Is he here? Yes, and he and Mrs. Davis are married. What? Judge Townsend and Mrs. Davis got married this afternoon. I fixed it. We won't have any more divorce people here, Bill. Then you'll have to close up. Mrs. Jones takes Bill's hand. I want to close up, Bill. I want to have a home again. All right. Smiles. She smiles back, rises, takes her chair, puts it right of table center. We're all going to have some supper. Where'd you get it? I've been cooking it. Crosses to Bill. Mother, I found out one thing when I was at the home. Mrs. Jones puts her arm about Bill's neck. What was that, Bill? Bill looks up at her. I found out that you was a good cook. Mrs. Jones smiles happily, suddenly puts her arms around Bill's neck and kisses him. Bill looks front in great surprise, then looks slowly at Mrs. Jones and smiles at her. She turns slowly but does not see Bill smiling. You didn't mind my doing that, did you, Bill? No. Bill? He looks at her. Would you kiss me? Yeah. After thinking it over, rises, goes slowly to Mrs. Jones. His face close to hers suddenly laughs. Mrs. Jones goes toward the kitchen door. Now, Mother, I was going to. Mrs. Jones at door. I guess you better have your supper first. She exits as John enters center, closes door. He carries a bag, puts it on table center. Did you see Judge Tuttle? Yes, it's all right. They never had their deed recorded. They were waiting for the divorce. Did you see your wife? Yes, yeah, she's all right. She's cooking dinner. John, hesitating. And is... is... Millie? Oh, she's waiting for you. Is she? Yeah, only she's afraid you ain't gonna forgive her. I think I can convince her about that. When you do, just give her this and it'll be all settled. He gives John ring. Now I know why you went into that jewelry store. Now you know why I borrowed that two dollars. Going toward dining room door. After you give it to her, come into the party. What party? Celebration, in here. Opens door short distance. Laughter heard inside. Bill peeks in, then calls in low tone. Millie. A cork is heard to pop off stage. 
Harper off stage. Ah, champagne. Bill exits quickly into dining room as Millie enters. Bill closes door after him. Millie sees John. He stands looking at her. Millie crosses to him, then... Daddy has told me what I ought to say to you. John, smiling. What is it? That I made a fool of myself, and I'm ashamed of myself, and I beg you to forgive me. <laughs> I can tell you something much better than that to say. Say, John, you might even make it John Dear or John Dearest. I know that you love me always, 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 because... Because that is something a woman must know. Yes, that's it. So I ought to say, please marry me. And I'll say, I will, Millie, if you'll have me. Millie, I want to show you something. Shows her ring. I've seen it. Oh, have you? It was very thoughtful of you to get it before you even spoke to me. I didn't get it. I never saw it till just now. Bill bought it for me to give to you. How can you help marrying me with everyone trying to force you to? I don't want to help it. There's only one thing I want to know. Do you care for me? Millie, turning away right from John. I can't tell you that now. Dining room door opens and Mr. Harper, then Mrs. Harper, Lem, and Mrs. Jones enter. All have glasses filled with champagne. Margaret and Lem have two glasses each. Lem gives John and Millie theirs, then takes one from Margaret. Yes, here they are. We've caught you. Mr. Jones has just told us the great news. What? Of your engagement. And we all want to drink your health. May your life together be as happy as... Indicating Mrs. Harper and himself. Ours has been. And as ours is going to be. Bill enters from right, raising glass. Come on, John. Oh, they can't drink yet. Then I'll do it for you. Here's the both of them. To Mr. and Mrs. Harper, Lem and Margaret. Now turn your backs. I'll laugh and do so. Don't let's disappoint them. John. They kiss. Bill turns and sees them kiss. Mother, look. She turns and sees them. I fixed that. Curtain. End of Act Three. End of Lightning by Winchell Smith and Frank Bacon.